a long time ago on a comics page far, far away. Welcome to Panel Up, your monthly pop culture panel. I'm John Campbell. And I am Mike Gurgani. Oh, Gurgani, we're, we're deep into summer. And with, at least at the moment, what summer means is big blockbuster movies. Does it? Well, it, it, for me, it the had... summer means struggling for your right to work fairly and justly in an oppressive system of capitalism. Wow, man, that is getting... Getting political right out the gate. No, for sure, this summer has definitely taken on a, a weird, weird uh, tone when it comes to entertainment. This summer also means finding the resources within myself to know that I'm enough and know that <laughs> struggle is what we all experience and that you should come to accept those struggles within yourself and those that you have to participate with others. <laughs> and your TED talk will soon be available about. Uh, I'm just saying there, yeah. we need to prep the listeners for like we're we're getting hard and heavy into all, all sorts of stuff today. It's it's yeah it's an interesting uh, we find ourselves like I said in an interesting place in pop culture right now because uh, the 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 film industry is is surging at the moment at least when it comes to major theatrical releases uh, setting all kinds of new records and and sort of indicating uh, people's want to experience things in, you know, movie theaters as a collective audience, while at the same time also there's a, you know, uh, a huge challenge to the entire concept of the business. So it's an it's a weird, weird time to be talking about pop culture. I think collective experience is a key phrase there that I think we're going to come back to a lot in this conversation because yes. simultaneously... And while this isn't, like, directly involved with the conversation we're going to have about the two movies we're talking about today, it mm -hmm. is also, like, a strange echo of this collective experience because simultaneously, while we have these two huge movies in theaters resurging the theater industry, of yeah. course, we're talking about Barbie and Oppenheimer today. Of the Barbenheimer it's Barbenheimer, people. baby. We also have this collective action of the the SAG and the, uh, the Writers Guild strike ongoing. Yes. Yep. At the same time, we also have the single largest musical tour ever conducted by a human being ongoing right now in the form of Taylor Swift. And I, yeah. it's, it's interesting to me that that is also happening at this exact same time. It's an interesting time. Like I said, it's a, it's a really interesting time to be talking about pop culture in general as we do on this show. Now, the thing that the Taylor Swift thing is, it just doesn't make a lot of impact uh, into like the 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 world I walk in, obviously, but it is happening in the larger context of pop culture. Like my news feed across everything doesn't include a lot of that, but I am still aware it's happening. Right, but you got it's it struck me last night thinking about this. That, like there are all these collective experiences happening, and one of them is like this icon Taylor Swift, and like yeah, you or I maybe not like the biggest Taylor Swift fans. I totally respect her as an artist, and I think she's put out some absolute bangers in recent years. Sure, uh, she's, I've, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, but, I, I'm kind of music is always sort of. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not cool enough really to you know. Sure. It's like uh, so, I just hear stuff and go. Well, that's pretty good. But at the same time, you're having audiences show up for her specifically that are the largest collective human experiences dedicated yeah. to a singular voice in human history. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty wild. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's it's just interesting that that she has that kind of universal appeal. Like I said, absolute bangers. <laughs> Some of them, yeah. I, I guess, yeah. Uh, you know, and and that that's that's why and like I said I've always kind of been on the fringe of the popular music anyway not in a cool guy way in a in really kind of an old man way even as a as even as a young man um so no i do think it's interesting that uh, yes there does seem to be and i think you know some of this has got to be a reaction right to the the lack of that uh, ability to gather in these collective experiences for the past several years with the pandemic right absolutely totally there's there's for sure like a just people are so wanting to break the shackles of that and sort of the cages of the like the pandemic experience that this feels like the first real summer where people feel comfortable enough to really go at it with that stuff 
Yeah, and obviously time is a flat circle. Our perceptions of exactly how much time has passed are increasingly skewed, I feel like. Yeah. But yeah. it has only been uh, three and a half-ish years, th less than that, since yeah. the start of the, like, the official start of the pandemic in terms of, like, how most of us experienced it. Obviously, the disease was rampant before all the lockdowns were called. Right, but... right, 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 right. Yeah, but, I mean, e even within that, still, you know, it, it only took a few months to really get there even. So, uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it both, it's one of those things where, yeah, as you're talking about time as a flat circle and perception of it is weird in that it feels like it's been a long time and also a short time somehow, right? I mean, that was the whole thing during the height of it, right? That uh, everybody was talking about it feels like it's either been a week or 10 years uh, day to day, right? Like, yeah. it's, it's been wild. It's it's really, there's, there's interesting and, and more qualified people could talk about the psychological perceptions of time and how that has altered uh, in recent years. But it's also like a demarcation point and something I'm, always struck by just thinking about big topics in my head and this is going to be an episode for big topics because both of these movies deal with like existential issues yeah, yeah. Um, in totally different ways but yeah is the idea that like we're living through currently a demarcation in any timeline you're going to see written about by historians Definitely. in the future is there's going to be a before the pandemic and after the pandemic in terms of like the same way we talk about before 9-11 and after 9-11. Like, there are just Absolutely. demarcation points in Western civilization as we perceive it, and we're living through one of them right now. Uh, we are, yeah. And there's no question about that. And it's, uh, uh, you know, we're seeing the, I think just, just with our sort of lens of pop culture alone, we're seeing kind of the, the beginning uh, threads of what that post- this experience can be not necessarily the elimination of the COVID pandemic, but just like the beginnings of these conversations about entertainment or that, right? What yeah. is the future of it? How is it, uh, uh, you know, ingested or whatever, how, you know, how is it, uh, disseminated? And, and I think that's, that's kind of what's interesting right now. And that's so much of what you see when people are talking about specifically the strike is a massive conversation about what even is this industry anymore. Mm -hmm. because and, clearly it's changing right but underlining that with this idea that i don't think a lot of people especially in the united states really even think about in so far as like uh, the the america the united states's biggest export is media mm -hmm. and and yep. no absolutely. one really thinks about that <laughs> no it 100 percent is it is absolutely this country's biggest uh, export and uh, and and every once in a while I'll hear somebody say that and you're like absolutely but yeah it's not it's not perceived as that because I think it's so uh, ephemeral right like yeah. to, to you it's 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 a passive experience but it is a product maybe you can't physically hold it especially not now uh, although I don't know if you've seen some of the theaters that have had to like expand their projection booth just to fit the size of film reel that Oppenheimer comes on. <laughs> How, uh, was, didn't they say it was like a two mile movie, something like that? Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely <laughs> wild. Um, if you laid also, out the film strip of Oppenheimer, you could be at a safe distance from the Trinity test. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And the thing is too, especially for those, the, the 70 millimeter ones, you're also talking about twice as wide as your normal 35 millimeter mm, film. God. So you're adding to that. I mean, some of the, I've, you can go online and see some of just the, the, just the reel of it where it's like, we just got Oppenheimer and just, it takes up like a whole room, just the, the canister. I love the idea of filmmakers who force structural change, like yeah. actual engineering issues yeah. to exist in theaters. Because the last one I can think of is George Lucas in terms of like converting all of uh, America's theaters in with like Dolby digital sound and with digital right. uh, yeah. projectors. For sure. I mean, and I think, you know, what's interesting is you see, uh, like a guy like James Cameron who kind of tried to make that happen and there was just sort of a, with the 3D and the high frame rate. And, of course, some of that stuck, but the idea of that being the new norm has certainly never taken off. I was actually just thinking about that the other day, and as I was seeing these movies, I looked around at all the screens like, are there any 3D showings of anything happening right now? And the answer some, is no. Yeah, sometimes they do, but it really... it's It's become the new... It's become 
normal. It hasn't become the new norm, but it's become normal. And also just most people have rejected it and gone like, yeah, no thanks. And so some stuff still gets 3D releases. But if you look, uh, like when I'm looking at movie theater showings, there may be a couple of 3D showings of a movie in a day for some movies. Mostly like mostly like a family and animated stuff. And that um, totally makes sense. Cause like I, I think I've, I was looking at, at for the release of Ninja Turtles where I was looking at getting tickets for it. There were like three or four 3D showings during the day of that. And you're like, okay. okay. But it, yeah. it, it, it it it's no notice no longer promoted. Like watch trailers for stuff. Remember they used to go see it in 3D. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that's taken off more, and actually that I'm certainly much more a fan of, is uh, the large format screens. Whether that be your IMAX, or your XD, just the idea of like see it big seems hmm. to be a bigger thing that that there's been more focus on promoting. Um, particularly with stuff like Mission Impossible or Oppenheimer. Where it is like see it in IMAX or whatever, you know. Yeah. Hmm. So I I do uh, yeah that that's kind of the more experiential thing. Whereas uh, if you look at a lot of stuff like I'm sure like Haunted Mansion is just like also in 3D. <laughs> oh, Haunted Mansion. Haunted Mansion <laughs> is is regardless of the movie itself is one of the stupidest business decisions I've ever seen a studio make. We were talking Man, about they this blew before it recording, that. but like what a weird choice to release this in the middle of the summer. As in like a middle? family Halloween movie, yeah, so weird. <laughs> no, it it. I mean, it. Yeah, man, like I said, I I I I can't speak to the quality of it. I haven't seen it. I don't get the sense from reviews that anybody loves or hates it. It seems just be like a eh. But it could definitely have found like a pop culture moment if it came out in. Uh, you know, it's got a forty one on Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, that's obviously not like great, but uh, you know. But whatever, like kids would go, oh, I want to see that spooky family movie. But here in the summer, no one is also just lost in the shuffle of blockbusters. I mean, that's already another problem that, that I'm sure we'll discuss here in general is there's just too many big movies out. Yeah. And obviously, again, we're talking about the lag of the pandemic and we're only now sort of be getting even with a lot of stuff that got pushed back through 2020, 2021 and into 2022. We're only just now sort of catching pace with a lot of that stuff that's true and it and and it's it's shaping up at, at least at the moment it looks like we could very well be looking at another delay in releases that may push stuff further now with the strike and a lot of movies are vacating release dates in the in the later sort of third of this year yeah because wasn't oppenheimer originally supposed to come out like a year ago like uh, as a, or i mean obviously i think it's production got pushed back and that's why yeah yeah uh, but, but like both Indiana you... Jones and Mission Impossible were definitely supposed to be last summer releases. Yeah. Um, because Mission Impossible got pushed a year because Top Gun got pushed a year. So, like, it's a whole thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're, st we're still seeing a lot of stuff that was, yes, that was absolutely scheduled for last summer. Come, I mean, God, God knows The Flash was supposed to come out, like, four years ago. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> The more I think about The Flash, the more I can see how that movie was compromised by, like, things that happened while The Flash was being delayed. <laughs> it's, 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 it's such a weird thing, and I think we're going to see that from everything I, I gather, um, even more so in Aquaman The Lost Kingdom, um, which now looks like it's getting pushed even again now because it was supposed to come out at Christmas time, and now that's looking like, because of the strike, now again another delay. Oh, but Jason Momoa is just doing Shark Week. What is he up to? Oh, right. Oh, Momoa. Momoa is fine. I mean, he had Fast <laughs> X. He'll be fine. That's the thing about Aquaman. That I the, the, the thing is like, Momoa doesn't need Aquaman. Whether he stays Aquaman, it doesn't matter. That guy is just a force to be reckoned with. It's kind of <laughs> like Cavill and Superman too, right? Cavill's yeah. not Superman anymore. He'll be fine. He's a major movie star unto himself. Ugh, there's such a bittersweet moment happening with Cavill right now in terms of like watching this last season of The Witcher that he's oh on. yeah. Or it's just yeah. like, ugh, he's so good in that part. Why can't we just have this forever? Because people are dumb. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 very unfortunate, and and, and that show's gonna fall off a cliff because so many people are just, regardless of who they replace, it's just like, no, I refuse to, and valid on that. The Superman people uh, who are like, I won't watch Superman if it's not Cavill. I don't understand them as much, but the Witcher people, I get. Mm -hmm. Well, because he was such like a a galvanizing force for that thing getting even off the ground right uh, and there isn't another at least not in terms of live action there isn't another 
Gerald. You know, there's not. Uh, the, so the well, thing Liam is, like, Hemsworth is what it's going to be. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. But it's sort of the thing about like the, the idea of anyone being the Superman yeah. is very silly because he's already like the eighth Superman. Right. No, that's true. So, yeah, it's, uh, James Bond, Batman, Spider Man, any of the icons are sort of like. Yeah, you can always try another one. Maybe it won't be as good. Who knows? We'll yeah. see. David Corn sweat. But there's <laughs> the thing. The other thing too about the Superman thing also that I always point out is there's already another Superman every week on television though. Yeah, there was exactly. already a second Superman. So there is a third Superman on television right now in the form. That's of, right. Like Jack my Wade is also with, Superman. Yeah, my adventures with Superman is also going. So there's yeah, that's the, those kind of icons are. But uh, but yeah, let's talk about the icons that are that are. Barbie and J. Robert Oppenheimer. <laughs> uh, they're they're they two are houses both, alike in dignity. <laughs> they are both iconic. I mean, no question about it. They are both icons of history and culture. Um, you know, the, there's there's one shot in, and of course, we'll just put it now. We're not going to be like necessarily diving through the intricate plot details of the of these movies point by point, uh, like sometimes because we're sort of talking about the two of them together as this experience, but. Spoilers will occur, so spoilers abound starting right. right here. If you haven't seen these movies, stop. I, I think especially for Barbie. Uh, Barbie in particular is a movie well, you, where in order to engage with it and talk well, about it to the full extent that I would like to, I think it mm -hmm. is important that we talk about certain things that the sure. ads for this movie did not actually like engage with, which I really enjoyed. Uh, also, it's tough to spoil Oppenheimer because, spoiler, he builds an atomic bomb. Like, I mean, let me just say, <laughs> yeah. like, history spoiled Oppenheimer. Um, you know, I mean, we get, well, it's, it, that's more about talking about approach and structure and, and, like, how it's handled. But, like, it's tough to reveal, <laughs> to spoil plot details of a man's life. I think the most spoilerific thing about I could say about Oppenheimer is their use of the uh, "I am become death destroyer of worlds" quote and how that yeah. is yeah, or uh, I mean, the, artistically the, I, inserted into that film. Sure, sure. I mean, that's what I'm talking. It is more the uh, the artistic approach to the movie in general. And I will say the biggest on that note, the biggest surprise of the movie to me that I didn't know going into it is that it's a it's a split perspective narrative. Yeah, I mean, look, as soon as I figured out that there were multiple timelines happening in Oppenheimer, I was like, well, yeah, of course, it's a Christopher Nolan film. But even beyond that, you have the <laughs> the, the, the the color and the black and white splitting Oppenheimer's perspective and Strauss's perspective, right? Sure, yeah. Um, whether, yeah. Yeah. Uh, God, fucking... RDJ in that movie was fucking great. Um. Amazing. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm so glad it's exactly what he needed to do, where you're like, right, right, right. This guy is one of our finest actors. And but also, just... like, him leaning into playing such an absolute trash monster of a human. <laughs> well, I mean, a, a, a incre as he always keeps saying, an incredibly complex man. As everyone in that movie is. I mean, that's one of the things I love so much about Oppenheimer is how incredibly complex everyone in that movie is. Every character is. Yeah. Um, I guess let's start out by talking about the the fusion form of this, the Barbenheimer of it all. Well, I mean, I... It, it. Yeah. It, it, well, it, I mean, it starts from the the, the most simple thing. It's just they, they came out on the same day, yeah. right? And there was, I think, initially. This was just born out of so weird that these two very different movies are coming out on the same day. Like I think there was I think the initial pop culture thing about it, like just the inkling of like, well that's weird. And then eventually it turned to, what if you saw them on the same day? Well that'd be weird. And then it kind of snowballed. There was a very similar thing that happened a couple of years ago on a smaller scale in the video game industry where mm. the new Animal Crossing for the Switch and Doom Eternal came out on the same mm. day. Mm. And so you have these things that are like, on paper, counter-programming to each other. The people who right. play Animal Crossing are probably not going to play Doom, and the people who play Doom are probably not interested in playing Animal Crossing. Yeah, and obviously the... there is a Venn diagram there of people well, who play but if you're, I'm if one you're, if you're focusing on being the marketing person, these things, these are different demographics in general when you're just talking about, like, promoting something to people, right? Right. So Barbie Oppenheimer releasing the same day, 
the producers involved look at those schedules and whereas sometimes when a big action movie is being released and they go we'll but there's a marvel movie coming out that week we should probably move our release date to somewhere else right Right. I mean, that was sort of the thing. I think I for sure thought there was a chance these two wouldn't come out the same day for that reason. There's also, I know, the one person you don't hear talk about this, because the one person who does not enjoy this is Christopher Nolan. Um, because he saw this as a middle finger from Warner Brothers to release Barbie the same day as his movie, because this is the first movie since he left Warner Brothers. Mm. And Barbie being their big summer movie... He sort of saw that as them coming for him. Now, I would say what's ended up happening is is actually, I think, in terms of, at least from a financial standpoint, Oppenheimer is the big beneficiary of this. I think that's absolutely true because, like I was saying, on paper, I feel like these two movies are counter-programming to each other. Obviously, sure. we're going to talk about the similarities and sort of the experience of seeing both of them. We we would never have been talking about the similarities of these movies, even if there are similarities, if they came out months apart. We just, you, I just don't think our minds would have put them together. No, absolutely. I, I, I even though, agree like I said, 100%. there are there are some broad, very broad similarities between them. And when I say similarities, I just mean in themes and like what yeah. the narratives are grappling with. Right. There is that, some weird correlation there. That 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 are there, but yes, yeah, seeing them and you literally saw them back to back. I did see them uh, like a week apart. Yeah. Let, let's start with the experiential like moment of this because there was this thing online. I guess is where it mostly took place of this mm -hmm. fusion of the Barbenheimer and the idea that one could, in theory, go to a theater and see them both back to back. And right. I'm sure it started out as, wouldn't that be weird? <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, it, it, like, like most things, it was just kind of a lark, right? It's like, that's so silly. Isn't that weird? Isn't that random? I mean, that's so much of any sort of internet or pop culture phenomenon these days, right? It's just like, mm -hmm. what? You know? And, of course, the memes, the posters are very funny. You can see, uh, I've seen so many shirts that are the I Am Become Death, but it's in the Barbie font. Or, <laughs> or the poster. Or Barbie standing outlined by the, the Trinity Test explosion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the, I, I, I love that, you know, they did all the, this Barbie's a physicist, this Barbie's a doctor, this Barbie's a what? And there's one that was, is just Killian Murphy as Oppenheimer, and it says, this can is the destroyer of worlds. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, 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 it's it's very clever. And I understand, look, there's already, I know that the people of Japan have really come out against some of that imagery. And, of course, they have a totally different relationship with this, which makes sense. Uh, Oppenheimer at the moment, has there there are, there is not a current plan to release the movie in Japan, period, which I think is is an interesting conversation unto itself that I'm really not in a position to make, but I, w I would, I would be fascinated to see what that culture's reaction to this movie is. Cause I, I, this movie is not like, yay, it's so good. We bombed Japan. I want to get into like what Oppenheimer is and isn't talking about as a film, because I think yeah. that's also part of the interesting conversation here, but mm -hmm. Before we get too deep into that, because yeah. what I have to say about that might spin us into a much windier conversation. Right, but I mean that like that. I the, the the there was a thing I was just reading an article this morning about like oh yeah, Japan really not enjoying Barbie in front of a mushroom cloud generally. Sure, Speaking. and that is a response to an internet culture movement that the filmmakers have no control over. Other right, than releasing yeah. the movies on the, the same day. By the way, be, beyond a base level, everybody should go see movies because it's good for the industry. Uh, the makers of these movies are not really merging them. Beyond like Killian Murphy going, oh, I'm going to go see Barbie. And Greta Gerwig going, oh, I'm going to go see Oppenheimer. Right. Uh, or Tom Cruise going, I'm going to both. And you should go see Mission Impossible. You know, <laughs> it's sort of been in the thing. Uh, I did see paparazzi photos of quentin tarantino buying tickets to both you know so it's sort of like i mean it's like beyond that you know uh, of he course is the tarantino guy sees them both on the same day of course he does that's i mean he 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 would have done that regardless of the meme though to be, yeah. let's, be let's be honest yeah. that's just that's the kind of guy he is i imagine uh, he does that constantly anyway and just sees everything that comes out period but uh, but I do yeah, uh, they're they're it, it's it's I mean it's that's the thing I'm talking about. They both benefit from this, but particularly Oppenheimer, because Oppenheimer is not 
I, I always thought it was talking about something. I always thought it was weird before the whole Barbie thing when they just announced this was a summer movie. You're like, really? A huge historical, you know, epic. It's like this should be this would be like a November. This would be like a, this is an Oscar play movie. That's what I was gonna say. Is like this way more reads to me as an Oscar play because like historical biopics by and large aren't usually rip roaring good times and this one especially is a dour grim film uh yeah yes uh, i mean depend yes to to the general public i do agree that i that i stand by barbie is the crowd pleaser of the two now yes. it's a rip roaring good time to me as a film nerd because i think it's a masterpiece of the craft sure but and that's a like different yeah. I get into it from a historical perspective and getting the over the shoulder reaction of yeah. the creation of this thing and having it be such a boots on the ground film about the creation of this moment in human history where we gain the ability to destroy ourselves as a species and civilization and having one guy at the center of that who is sort of cognizant of that fact is yeah. super interesting and I yeah. I really really loved Oppenheimer but the person yeah. I saw the movie with was bored and didn't like it because it is a pretty dry historical like movie <laughs> well I, I, we'll get into that conversation but I, I i would not say dry um but that's you know that's that that's that's to each their own you know measure on that but yes it is it is a more quote-unquote whether this is fair or not serious movie it's a it's a you know it's it's a film for adults for the uh, uh, it's it's a contemplative film it's a it's a very you know, whereas opposed to Barbie is what I think of as a July release. It's fun. You, I, I think, I keep seeing people talking about, wasn't well, this a kid's movie? It's, well, it's not a kid's movie, but it, it is a movie you can take the family to, which I think it, is different than, than, than it being a, a children's film. By comparison, Barbie has this bright, bubbly energy to it that is, while trying to talk about bigger existential stuff, especially in the third act of the film, is doing it in a way where it has to fuse it with the, the pop commercial sensibilities of this brand that they're using to talk about yeah. this stuff, and that is Barbie. And so there's this day glow energy to that film because yeah. that's the brand of Barbie that you're that, grappling with. That is that is sincere in it, right? I mean, I yeah. think that's the key to Barbie that I that I, I and I know they've been for years they've been trying to make a Barbie movie and there's a really good article with uh, screenwriter Diablo Cody who wrote Juno is what she's most famous for but she's written a bunch of I'm a big fan of hers yeah but she was she spent years doing a, a draft of Barbie uh, for Warner Brothers when it was Amy Schumer was attached to star in it and she was talking about that that take was very much at that point in time when they hired her to write it it was very much a uh, a takedown it was going to be a feminist girl boss barbie's so fucking stupid she set the whole feminist movement back decades and diablo Cody talked about like i just couldn't crack it as a narrative right that seemed to be the whole thing was like yeah man take down barbie and that's really because that's not the movie greta gerwig made it brings up a lot of issues but i think it also it, it, it it's a really tricky thing and i feel like the fact it's as good as it is is crazy because yeah. they're it's one of the it, barbie is one of those movies where you see the a million ways it is unwatchable and they kind of found the one way where not only is it good it's really good and very clever and you know i think it rides a very similar line though i think it is a more important film for a, a given level of importance than the lego movie I think they ride yeah, a very I, that, similar line in terms of talking about their subject matter, but also the brand they are a part of and engaging in both at the same time while acknowledging some of the problematic aspects yeah. of the brand they're a part of. Without it being like, once again, just shitting on it. Because I, I, I see what Diablo Cody's talking about when we go like, yeah, that's not a movie. Like, I can't, yeah. what is that? You can't engage with that as an audience. And also... That's kind of inside. Like, I, I think that movie would have turned people off and go like, hey, man, I have fond memories of playing with my Barbies. It doesn't have to be a wholly negative experience. Because um, I do think one of the things that the movie does a really good job of dealing with, and I think I, I the first thing I definitely thought of coming out of it was I was very much thinking about the Lego movie. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, 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 yeah, it, it really does a similar thing. Is 
it, the movie kind of is talking about Barbie in some ways is kind of a blank slate. She, she is what you imbue her with, right? Like as right. and and I mean that's literally the plot of the movie uh, at a certain point. Like the idea that America Ferrera it has that the, the the Barbie is reflecting the person who owns it, right? And to a greater extent, America Ferrera is a metaphorical tabula rasa for women in general of western yeah. civilization who have had to grapple with barbie as this uh, i don't know lodestone around the neck of women and like what their expect expectations are again we are two white guys who are well, not sure a hundred percent qualified to talk about all of the themes that go into the Barbie movie. I've seen people move to tears by this film about how it expresses certain things yeah. about the ideolo ideology that, of women and how they are perceived and how they perceive themselves. And certainly uh, that wasn't my experience, but I can totally see what they are grasping onto in this movie. Sure. That's where empathetic is, yeah. human beings who understand that other people have emotions and that they have experiences well, that we can't I, necessarily understand. That's yes, that first. And two, it's such, I think it's such a well-made movie yeah. that you clearly see what it's saying. And I think that's interesting because I've seen very, very mild criticism, mostly from people who are complete idiots when it comes to uh, film analysis and who's, a, but like, I, I've seen uh, either that uh, I've seen some criticism that it's like, well, it, it just so blatantly states its opinions and punches you in the face with its themes, to which I would argue, sure, but that's not a negative. I mean, in as much as it's not a kid's movie, but it is a bright pop centric, you know, uh, uh, bubblegum pop colored mass marketed summer movie so yeah its themes are gonna have to be greatly stated because it's dealing in it's dealing in iconography right so you're dealing with incredibly broad things so it kind of makes sense that like to break through that you, you can't have a i don't know what the subtle drama of barbie would be well and that's the thing how many movies have there been about the the female experience especially in western culture and how they are attempting to have a conversation with a larger 50% of the population saying like, this, these are the issues we deal with. And this movie is maybe the culmination of that insofar as like, fuck subtlety. These are the problems that we're having to deal with. Well, and like I said, that also <laughs> to, to appeal to as big an audience that it can make this kind of money. Yeah. It kind of has to do it. Cause I have seen Greta Gerwig's other two films as director those are both amazing movies that deal in a lot of the same subject matter, but they are much more subtle movies that played in art house cinemas and didn't make nearly as much money. I, I, but if you if you enjoyed Barbie, by the way, you should seek out both Lady Bird and Little Women because they are mm, both mm -hmm. excellent movies made by Greta Gerwig. P somewhat disappointed that the next thing she's doing is making Chronicles of Narnia for my own... But if that's what's important to her and that seems to matter to her, then that's great. I just... It's a little bit like, oh, okay. That's less fun to me. But that's fine. Like I said, that's fine. I'll um, be but very I curious love... to see what her take on the Jesus Lion story is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the fact that I mean, it's just like, let's get to kick off like a, a planned shared universe. You know, like, uh, of oh, course God, it is. I, I don't care. Um, the other thing, the other thing that, that comes from that is I'm also fucking terrified of the lesson <laughs> that Hollywood is going to learn from this. Because immediately when I see news about the Lena Dunham directed Polly Pocket movie, I'm like, no, don't. Sure. I couldn't. God, that's the worst. That is. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. I go, that is the joke headline I would have written <laughs> as a as a satire on what Hollywood will learn from this. You know, it's the it's a. Mattel going, well, next we're going to do Barney as an introspective A24-esque drama. They said that. They said that in a press release. Sure. They're going like, this is what we do now. And you're like, no. Like we're talking about, this was a perfect fusion of filmmaker, theme, and intellectual property. And it all worked in this very specific way. Trying to replicate this, oh boy, we're going to see some garbage. John, don't you know that Stretch Armstrong is a metaphor for spreading yourself too thin? I that was that's the joke I keep making is I can't wait to see why does Stretch Armstrong stretch himself so much. I mean, it is it's going to be the thing where it's like, okay, now it's it's so funny to watch major 
media conglomerates try to reckon with artistry like this <laughs> where it's like people like this thing we will make art in an art manner you know it's just like you're trying to you're trying to like uh quantify something that's this like ephemeral feeling because yeah. also i think the other thing is too people played with Polly Pocket. I don't think they have a lot of the same feelings. I don't know what, like, universal experiences there can be. In, be I mean, the whole thing there is going to be being marginalized or feeling small, right? I mean, it just feels like... It's... Yeah. It, it's interesting because we mentioned the Lego movie earlier, and beyond Lego and Barbie, yeah. there yeah. are so few other brands that are as ubiquitous, I feel right. like. Well, we so, talked about this with the the Spider Verse movies too, right? It's like yeah. you can't. Spider Man's one of the only superheroes you could even do something like that with, right? Because it's so universally known, and I just think, the iconography of it is so ingrained in just civilization at this point, Western well, civilization or not. One of the things I love in the movie is every time they indicate a kind of Barbie, they're like, "No, this really was one of the like." That's how mm -hmm. it like you can go into the deep bench. The thing about her pregnant friend Midge that was a thing, and we discontinued it because it's kind of weird, you know. Or like the, that, the, the the grow growing up teenager who's like breasts inflate. Was just real like, oh, product, yeah, real thing. <laughs> oh, by the way, also if you uh, if you enjoyed Barbie, I also recommend. I always recommend this show, but the Barbie episode of the Toys That Made Us is excellent yeah. and gets into. Uh, a lot of the real stuff around it, and and I, I think you know touches on you know similar to if you want to watch Oppenheimer, there's uh, a great documentary about him as well, or of course the book that Nolan adapted, American Prometheus. Um, but uh, yeah, I just there's there's a lot of stuff around Barbie. It is sort of like when you're dealing in these cultural icons, Barney, not the same thing. Hot Wheels, not that. Oh, there's a fucking Hot Wheels movie in development too. Oh, Why not, sure. man? Yep. Why not? Why do those cars go so fast? What propels them? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just sort of like, and, and it's the same thing. We'll always see it. It's the same thing with. I shudder to think what that Super Mario movie, uh, Brothers movie that was out earlier, is going to lead to. Oh my God, the garbage that that's going to. Because it's because the Hollywood method is always to rinse and repeat. And I say that about Barbie specifically because I don't know what the success of Oppenheimer will lead to other than like somebody's gonna make an einstein movie now i'm sure i'm sure of it yeah i and... can't wait for the nils Bohr biopic man i just oh <laughs> what's it gonna uh oh. written directed and starring kenneth Branagh. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> it's a spin-off of sorts man that dude just loves doing accents that's what he that's like the the whole la late chunk of his career is i'm an accent actor now and you sure. know what I'm here for it. I love Kenneth Branagh, and I will see as many Hercule Poirot movies as he wants to make. I he think clearly Hockey wants Venice to make all great. of them. <laughs> yeah, and I don't even know that they're that successful, but I think by his sheer willpower, he is making them happen. And he's talking about a shared universe of Agatha Christie movies now. He's like, uh, next one, I want to team up with Miss Marple. And you're like, yeah, man, get Dame Helen Mirren, make her Miss Marple. Let's do it. Let's sure. just go. Sure, why not? <laughs> I think they're very... I've enjoyed his... but. It definitely is like, <laughs> and as long as Chris Nolan keeps putting me in his movies as weird accented characters, mm -hmm. then I'll be happy. But yeah, and he's great, by the way. I mean, as much fun as we're in, he's great in the couple scenes. It's it's a the whole all of Oppenheimer. To get to that, since we since we're on the Brana thing, one of the things that that I think is so great about it is, it's an all star cast in a way. Oh man, I'm, I'm in in a, in a very old fashioned way. Like when you used to make film epics, right? Mm. You would be every single part would be played by a super well known actor, and even if it's just for a couple scenes. But what that does is you're like, whoa, that that puts a great actor in every part, basically, right? So yeah, yeah. Nils Bohr is only in a couple scenes, but when he shows up, he crushes because it's Kenneth Branagh, and also for characters like that. When Oppenheimer seals, sees Bohr, you're like, whoa. And we do as well because we carry the pop culture knowledge of what an important actor Kenneth Branagh is. Yeah, it has a it has a metatextual weight to it that you can lend importance or feeling to a character who might have historical significance. But in the film that we're watching, we can't necessarily grasp that unless the film grinds to a halt and tells us who this is. So by filling those parts with actors we recognize in specific ways, even if it is like Kenneth Branagh as someone we know is esteemed or if it's... Uh, right. 
oh, what's his name? Uh, Jason Clark is like, oh, he's got a bad guy face, so we automatically dislike him as yeah, yeah, Roger yeah. Rob. Well, and it's also something Nolan talked about was, uh, and I saw an interview with him uh, where he was talking about this. He goes, especially when you get to like the Manhattan Project, these guys were rock stars in this field. So yeah, I cast actors who are movie stars, right? Like in that sense, right? So it's sort of like, because you go like when Josh Hartnett shows up, you're like, oh, damn. I don't know who this real guy is, but if he's played by Josh Hartnett, he must be pretty cool. I was so taken aback by Josh Hartnett showing up in this film because I was just like, Josh, Josh Hartnett, I haven't, se- I haven't seen you in ages. Yeah, that's. I mean, uh, maybe that just speaks to the differences. There's, there's been a, there's been a few years of a, a Josh Hartnett comeback, but more, he's been working with Guy Ritchie a lot lately. Mm. Um, he's been doing. I mean, I get. Yeah, I mean, I do always start to go like, what do you mean? I've seen a bunch of stuff, but then I'm always going like, well, I guess he's in the things I watch, which are not necessarily what everyone's watching. Nobody saw Wrath of Man. They should. It's really good. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's he's a guy who I've always really liked because he was definitely. Um, like in the early 2000s, like when we were in high school and stuff, he was a big heartthrob, but he could act. And I always am drawn to those guys. We'll talk about Gosling later when we talk about Barbie, but I've always really been drawn to the guys who are like super hunky, but it's almost like, nay, move past that. He's really good at acting, actually. Um, And I also really respect him because he, at a certain point, just left the industry. He moved back to his hometown and goes... I don't want to be a heartthrob. I don't like the parts that are coming my way. I'm just not going to act anymore. Right. And, and then, that was sort of after, uh, like, Penny Dreadful, that sort of era. Oh, Penny Dreadful was sort of the beginning of him coming back. That was like him dipping his toe back in. Mm. It was kind of in that, um, it was more like post-30 Days and Night. Because mm. mm-hmm. if you look, there's, I mean, he. it's not like he ever completely left. But, you know, from the mid-2000s until you know, kind of the the uh, late 2010s, there's not much in his career. Mm-hmm. A smattering of stuff. And then slowly over the past couple of years, he started to build that stuff back up. He just did a Black Mirror. Uh, he's been, I say he's been in a couple of uh, uh, Guy Ritchie movies. Oppenheimer, though, has been a big thing because I think just in particular, people are always going, God, once again, he's really good. He's really good in this movie. Well, and... I don't think there's necessarily a weak link in the no, cast everybody's of Oppenheimer. <laughs> no, because, it, I mean, this really did... Nolan has reached... A, I think Oppenheimer is... I agree with... Uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. has said this many times in the press for the movie, that Oppenheimer is the culmination of Christopher Nolan's entire directing career. And I think that is true in a lot of ways. And in one of them, it is the ultimate example of... He can do anything. He can get he can get somebody to back anything. Because I can't think of many other filmmakers that would go, I want to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on a three hour biopic of Oppenheimer and a studio going, You got it. Yeah. But he I mean to, to talk about he may be currently the ultimate blank check director. I really do think it is like him and Tarantino are two of the only guys who will absolutely get financing for whatever they write. Like there's I- no I mean, there are certain directors out there who just, like, have such heavy name cachet, like Spielberg, who it's like, he could get any film he wanted made. He also owns the studio, though. He's a little bit outside of it to a certain extent. But, yes, he can basically finance anything. But even Scorsese, you know, look, at there's a reason he's gone to the streaming services, because they'll give him money to make The Irishman or Killers of the Flower Moon when a studio uh, would be like, "Mm, that doesn't seem profitable. So even somebody with that (laughs) kind of right. Um, yeah, well, it's interesting, though. The Irishman actually, like, in its limited release, did really well. And that's why Apple is sort of doing... Apple. Well, we can talk about this just in general. I really, Apple is really trying to do... Um, trying to find the middle ground that I think is, in my opinion, going to be the future of film, which is, you know, these, like, theatrical releases where it comes out for, like, two or three weeks, and then it's available to stream, like, really fast. Yeah. Um, and so it really is... Because I think as with everything right the technology is always heading towards people just want to choose how they're going to experience something and i think that's i think that's good actually um speaking of how to experience things i do want to before we get too deep into this talk about how people are experiencing these movies because we talked yeah. briefly about the idea that like one could do these as a double feature and sure. you and i chose to experience these films in fairly different ways in that i did do the double feature and you saw them what like a week apart 
Yeah, roughly, yeah. Which one did you see first? I saw Barbie first. Same. Okay. Yeah. So that and people apparently that's not the advisable way to do it. I don't. I don't. <clears throat> there there know. seems to be. There seems to. Well, let me just say at least that's not the popular way of doing it. Let me say. Sure, that. I could understand Barbie I get. as the palate cleanser, as yeah. the like. Okay, I've experienced something dour for three and a half hours. I need to have a better outlook that the world has color and life and love in it. <laughs> It's so interesting. I, I I mean, you keep saying, I actually didn't find myself as devastated by Oppenheimer as some people did. I think it's contemplative. It's de definitely dealing with dour themes. I don't know that I left the movie feeling dour. Now, maybe this is just how I feel about other Chris Nolan movies, too. But agreed, it's dealing and challenging things. But I think it's interesting. It's just interesting that you say Shh. that that was more overwhelming, I think, to you than it was I... to me. And again, I saw Oppenheimer second in a day that lasted like 10 hours of sitting in a theater. Um, yes, this is much different. I had a considerable amount of time between the two. So I had this emotional roller coaster of starting my yeah. day off seeing Barbie. I saw this yeah. th on, a, on a Monday and the theater yeah. was still packed, which was wild. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll talk about I had two radically different theater experiences for oh, these movies. Absolutely. Same. Um, yeah. And these were within hours of each other. <laughs> but I even saw them at different theaters in different formats. Um, yeah. Uh, so the reason I think I'm being a little bit hyperbolic with my description of Oppenheimer. Well, and it's, it's not just you. Like I said, I mean, the, the early word when they were first screened was like, people are leaving devastated. And I, and, and it, I mean, I'm not saying I don't see what they're reacting to. I think what Oppenheimer brings out in a movie going audience in general and something that I think most people probably don't contemplate on a regular basis, whether or not they are actively doing it or just like the human brain doesn't like to function on this level for an extended period of time is the idea of total existential extinction, right? Sure. <laughs> The, the, mo it, the movie ends on the note of what if all the nuclear bombs launched, humanity would be erased. Yeah, but I mean, I guess my attitude is like we always, I mean, that, that is always there, right? I mean, there is always that. But I think the thing that's interesting about the movie that surprised me about the movie, especially the way people talk about it, is it's not, it, it is about J. Robert Oppenheimer as opposed to the bomb itself. Right. Right. I mean, like it is about a man's perspective. So what I like is it is it is indulging in Oppenheimer's vision of that and his realization of that. The idea of going from theory to practicality is also really fascinating. Like, um, but I, no, but that's the, what I'm saying. I get so I get that. It's just I think I think what I latched onto was just different things. But what I think is there. so affecting about Oppenheimer specifically is the idea, or not even the idea, what they do in practice is bring you into a man's panic attack about that existentialism and about that crisis. I think this has one of the, like, mo especially seeing it in IMAX with the, like the audio cranked up really loud yeah. and being a yeah. part of that. I think this movie has one of the most like affecting panic attack sequences I've seen. Oh in yeah. Film in so far as it almost caused me to also have a panic attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, and I think that's something that I, well, like I said, I think what's what's so great about Nolan's script and his film is it's always, I mean, we talked, I think, I don't know if we talked about this on here, but I've talked about that Nolan wrote the script in first person, which I don't know that I've ever heard of anyone doing that in anything. Um, certainly Nolan says it the first time I've done it and I go, no, I've never heard anyone do that. So I think you and uh, I were talking about that off mic and my response is similar now is that like after having seen the movie i think that makes a lot of sense and i think that's mm -hmm. like one of the better ways to get into the head of a guy like oppenheimer who obviously all you can really go off of is biographies and a lot of his right. like, first-hand accounts and stuff and he even, talk to he even i mean he is specifically or whatever is his primary source let's say but the movie is credited as being based on one of those biographies which i said is american the book prometheus, american prometheus yeah. yeah um you know and i think but i think the thing that that struck me at Oppenheimer and one of the reasons i loved it so much and the one of the reasons i love 
I, I am more often drawn to narrative films uh, about real people than I am documentaries or biographies or things like that is there there is the creative license and, and people and we've even had those conversations about like specific facts and figures and, and of course those movies play fast and loose with that but there is an attempt and at their best and this movie does this better than so many historical films of caring less about what happened than what it felt like yeah. And that is something that only the narrative film can do. The documentary, it just can't. It's more interested in the, I mean, and there are attempts to do it, but it is, you are dealing always with the people's recounts and stuff like that. This is using the, the medium. And I think this is truly one of those things when you talk about both of these movies and your, your reactions to them and other people's reactions to them is sort of gets into that, like, why do we go to the movies, right? And here, here I am getting existential, hugely so, just about the, the art in general. And these are two very different films that are using the the medium to come at broad themes in different fashion. A conversation I had just last night about Oppenheimer specifically was this idea that this movie isn't a documentary. It isn't trying to present no. all of the facts surrounding yeah, this it, event and the right. the moment and the the details leading up to it. It is like maybe not purposefully vague, but it is vague insofar as like Oppenheimer himself isn't concerned with certain details, so those details aren't of a concern to the film. So this film is only trying to bring you into the emotionality of Oppenheimer the man, not right. how it reflects on the world greater than Oppenheimer well, the man. Because specifically I, I, this conversation was about the like the fallout literally of the Trinity test that is presented in this film as this moment of like glorious horror in a way. Well, it's both beautiful and horrific, right? The way it's right. portrayed on screen. And 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 that that's truly one of the best moments in cinema this year, I think, is that Trinity test moment. And also, of course, the the amazing fact that they keep quoting that there is no CGI in the film at all. And I was, I knew that going into that film and that yeah. moment is just like all the more wild with that knowledge in your head. But yeah, there is a, a, a greater conversation around the idea, not the idea, the fact that the, that test and the tests that happened after the fact in New Mexico made certain areas that were inhabited by people, yeah. Native Americans, Mexicans, a cancer-ridden hellscape for a yeah. lot of individuals who live there. And how the fact that, like, the film doesn't address that, but is this film in a space to address those things? Probably not. Like, and you no, can do no, a lot no. of and reading that... about that sort of stuff. I mean, hell, uh, jo didn't, like, one of the thoughts on, like, how John Wayne got cancer was filming oh, well, in those areas a lot. Yeah, actually, everybody who worked on that movie ended up dying of cancer. Well, um, we're talking about but, The Conqueror. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. John Wayne's, it's... like, really uh, badly thought out <laughs> Genghis Khan movie. Yeah, it's a it's a bad movie. But, yeah, that is, I mean, that is the thing people have talked about, is, like, the vast majority of people who worked on that movie died of cancer. Now, I'm always a little bit of the pushback on uh, the, that that's how John Wayne got cancer, because he also smoked, like, five packs of cigarettes sure. a day. Probably didn't help, but yeah. it is an interesting thing that you look at, like, everyone who worked on that movie died of cancer. Right, um, but the idea that, like, they got cancer and died because they were out there shooting for a few months and inhaled a bunch of dust that was irradiated yeah. by these tests right. and the Trinity well, test specifically. I think um, something that the, that, the, that the movie does a really good job of by putting it into that singular first-person perspective. And, and, and actually, I said, I think the interesting thing about it is it's really split between two first-person perspectives because when we go to Strauss, it's his perspective of things. And then at the end of the movie, when you're jumping back and forth between them and you realize how th all these timelines connect to each other through these two guys mm -hmm. um, is really... I mean, I think that's the thing about... Uh, that's why I push back on the idea of it being dry. If that's someone's perception, whatever. But like to me, I don't find it very dry because... Nolan is at his core a thriller director. It always has been. And this is still structured like a thriller. It still has this third act where you're like, oh, because the thing, Strauss is playing the right, right, right. Like it's, you know, when you realize how all the, all these hearings are connected to one another, Maybe. and you realize how the timelines line up, it's still yeah. very Nolan. Maybe dry is not the right word then. Mm. I, I think a limited vocabulary here because not all of us are 
uh, film aficionados. I'm just parroting sure. what I've had other people yeah, tell yeah, yeah. me. I guess I would probably describe it more as the excitement that you can derive from those thriller moments is mm -hmm. in the like knowledge of how these things connect, but it is not like any kind of whiz bang pop fun finale. No, it is no, the no. Culmination of all of these events and the way it's edited together to present this. Uh, well, and I think I think like like the... cognitive realization, I guess. It, yeah, yeah, the, that's what the movie the... itself isn't presenting action; it's making you go, "Oh." Yeah, yeah, and that's also something that's been very much clear, you know, in in all of Nolan's work, right? I mean, he's very he's perceived as a very cerebral filmmaker, which he really is, and often it is the the realization of those things. Oftentimes, that includes more sort of. Uh, classic beats of entertainment and action and stuff like that but you think right. of even something like the prestige right is is built on that sort of thing or memento which are a little bit less action driven but i think the thing that i love about his writing is that there is this uh it is asking you to engage with it on an exciting level of the mind mm -hmm. while also presenting he is also one of the great visual filmmakers and i don't know that anybody else could have presented this material in as affecting a way because actually this is the, the this is not the first movie about the manhattan project there's a movie from the 1980s called fat man and little boy that people it, it's it, it's it's not well remembered because it's really like fine um and in that the whole like dramatic tv series about this which is do you see the thing about that where the showrunner said their first choice for oppenheimer was killing murphy for that show totally <laughs> yeah yeah uh which is because he, he, the guy does kind of look like oppenheimer really uh actually um, and actually he, I don't know when he goes like, he had to go on a strict diet and he lost 20 pounds to play out. I'm going to Killian Murphy had 20 pounds to lose because he's already rare. like, yeah. yeah, like a rail thin guy. He got, I mean, he is gaunt in the movie. There is no question. He is sickly thin in the film. There's well, the, the scene, the scene the, for when they inevitably do the live action version of Nightmare Before Christmas. I know who my Jack Skellington's going to be. <laughs> well, I mean, he played the Scarecrow, right? Like, I mean, yeah. there's the, that makes sense. And I, I mean, they, they talk about the first time he and Nolan met was when he screen tested for Batman. And he said there was a general consensus of, yeah, that this isn't going to work. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, can, you can, and you can watch it, by the way. It's online. It's, it's actually become very popular again. His screen test is in one of the documentaries, and you can see. And he just he he does he looks weird in the costume. Like that, you have to screen test in the bat suit, and that face in that suit is just like hmm, little little bizarre. I want to see a totally jacked Killian Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like he's a guy who even if he got totally jacked, you almost wouldn't be able to tell. There are those guys <laughs> like that where it's like you just can't put the mask on; they get really defined. But, but they just like, can't. It's like when Paul Rudd got really jacked in Ant Man. You're like, well, yeah, I see more muscles on him, but he's mm -hmm. not bigger. Yeah, I just want to see Murphy's head on like Hemsworth's body. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just that would just be it, your brain wouldn't know what to do with that image. Right. You're like, I don't. This button just doesn't add up. Um, <laughs> when you see that too, because there's, I mean, there's a scene where he's nude in it, and you are just, I, all I could focus on is just how spindly he was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he he and is much as... he is gaunt in a way that like provokes this idea of undeath, and that's obviously yeah. purposeful, right? Well, it's 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 an interesting thing because I mean the dude was really thin, and I feel like yes, that is then build building on top of that is the uh, is is sort of the themes of the movie, and 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 of course the idea that. You know, famously, the I am become death. So here is a guy who is death, uh, essentially on screen, and is also, I think, the fascinating thing about the movie, and what I what I like so much about the way uh, uh, Nolan portrays this arc of the character, is this guy who I mean, he spends so much of the movie talking about well, theory, theory, and this is all in theory, and he built this bomb in theory. It's only in the later part of the movie that he realizes the actual effect that it had. Of course, you he is purely focused on the science of it until it's like, Oh yeah. And hundreds of thousands of people are dead. It's like, Oh, did I, did I, did I do that? Like not in a Steve Urkel way, but, uh, but it is, you know, but I'm saying like, it, but it is sort of a thing where it's like when you're a scientist in a lab and you see that literally they are taken outside of the world, essentially out to this little town in, in, uh, in New Mexico, which 
By the way, uh, also the other crazy thing about the movie, not a single shot of it was done on a soundstage. It's all practical, real locations that they built or found. Sure. Um, Oppenheimer, which is amazing. So they, they, the production designer built Los Alamos based off of historical photos of exactly what it looked like when they were there, um, down to precise detail. Um, I, I'd love to be the carpenter who gets that project. Be like, yeah. oh, okay, you got to build Los Alamos. How do you do that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, and it was an intense process. And Nolan is you know a very precise director obviously a very detail oriented guy mm -hmm. um so uh there's a reason he works with a lot of the same people because i think he really trusts those people totally. but the the but i think there's a thing about that too where it's like even by the idea of this removal of them from the rest of the world and being out here which is part of that is practicality because we're going to test these bombs we're not going to do it in a city um so but but by doing that is it is it cuts you off from the rest of the world so all you're focused on is the theory of what we're building nobody's real and even oppenheimer to a certain extent is and he's definitely being naive when he says this but it's like there, there's some part of him that's like well they're not really gonna use them though and the idea something this movie does tackle head on which i appreciated was this idea that a lot of people got on board this project because the threat was the Nazis getting the bomb before anyone else. And that right. like somebody specifically in the Third Reich would have access to this technology. And the moment that stops being a threat, the moral question of whether or not to even pursue this line of thinking comes into question. Once you're not up against the ultimate evil that is the Nazis. Well, it, it, it does start to be the thing, and, and then this sort of the thing about, like, once they started building it, you can't unring that bell then, right? You can't yeah. just, like, abandon it, because now you're like, well, now that we even know it's possible to build it, then regardless of the Nazis, somebody will build it, and then that brings the Russians into it, uh, and, and that whole thing. But I do think that is always a thing, too, about Oppenheimer, right, is you sort of go, like, because Oppenheimer is such a bizarre figure in history, or and such a complex one. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think, I, I mean, something I've always felt about him is like, well, somebody was going to do that, if not him. I mean, I do, I do believe that's the case. Now, the moral implications of that go even further. And the movie, I don't think, beyond just the nuclear bomb is a terrible thing, ob objectively, like it is in its destructive force. But I think even the movie is, is, is showing you that just like, I don't fucking know. Like, yeah. it, th these are, these are questions that can't have answers. It's, it's, it's very like like the the morality of of dropping those bombs. You hear the justification for it, and you're like, yes. Once again, you're still functioning in theory. That is sound logical theory. Now that then gets taken. Well, because I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, like on paper, when you're not actually talking about dead people, right? You're talking about theory, and that's that's the thing. I think the movie is yeah. ask is is debating the back and forth of that. Yes and no. And again, I know this isn't the movie to have this conversation, but the conversation that was being had about why to use a weapon like this, specifically on Japan, and I can understand the point of view of a Japanese audience not wanting to engage with this, because... Sure. And this is a whole other conversation that this movie is not really about, and that is Japan sort of addressing its imperial heritage, and whether right. or not it the people of that country want to be confronted with some of the horrible things that their country did during World War II. Right. Um, because they've worked so hard to try to move past that as, like, their history, quote-unquote. Which and... is, I, I mean, which is, I mean, and, I, and I, I, I applaud them for that, right? Like, I do think that is such a radically different world for yeah. them than it was during that era. But, but something that this movie doesn't talk about is the decision to to use nuclear weapons on Japan at the end of the war, once Germany had basically already fallen out of the war, it was pretty clear that Japan couldn't win the war either. And like, right. but what would, what it would have cost to defeat Imperial Japan was probably an invasion of the home islands, which they do say in the movie, but exactly right. what that would have cost is not something this movie talks about in any kind of detail. And having, I don't want to toot my own horn here, but having done quite a bit of reading on this subject, it would have been monstrous. Yeah. And 
the ethics of dropping nuclear weapons is something that this movie deals with a lot. And part mm -hmm. of the reason it is so affecting is that, like, there isn't a good reason to do it. But that's from our perspective now. And people living with the emotions of the men who died during the Pacific campaign just at the end of World War II, like, we can't have their perspective because we're no. automatically living in a world where we have hindsight. The, that's it. I mean, then I think that's one of the things, like I said, I think that's one of the things the movie in general does such a great job is it's it's all about what it felt like in the moment, right? Not in the broad strokes of what you're talking about, but it is sort of like you do feel like in that scene, by the way, also one of my favorite actors, James Remar, pops in for just that one scene where they're talking where they're talking about deciding where to drop the bombs mm -hmm. right and he's the one who's sort of going like well look man we are stuck between impossible choices which yeah. they were now what i think the movie says and what i would say also is even as much as i understand of history i can't say one way or another of course it's monstrous but as you're saying it also would have been you know horrible had we actually like invaded tokyo I don't know. I don't know where the, the cost of life versus what, you know, right? It's sort of the thing about, like, did less people die because of that? Did more people die? Who knows? It's impossible because well, there's all... And something they do talk about in the film is, I'm glad they addressed it, is, like, Tokyo wouldn't have been the cities that would have invaded because Tokyo was burned to the ground by right. maybe a much worse methodology of bombing, which is firebombing. Um, right. And, like... The idea that it was strategically done because we knew the infrastructure of Japan was particularly flammable. And so we concocted a bombing methodology that specifically burned everything to the ground. And is that better than a single pulse of horri horrifying light that vaporizes th tens of thousands of human beings? I don't know. I have no way of judging the morality balance there. No, and there and there is no way. And I like that the, the movie, that's what I'm saying, the movie itself only presents these people and their thinking. The movie, I don't think, really comes down to... Because I never. it always feels like, even though it's a movie written and directed by Christopher Nolan, it, we are in Oppenheimer's mind, and yeah. uh, and also to a certain extent. Although I would argue, actually, uh, I'll get to the Strauss thing in a second, but the, the, the thing I like about that is, because of that, I never get the sense, this is Chris Nolan going, here are my thoughts about nuclear war. Yeah. Beyond, it is just terrible, and here's the story of a guy who made a nuclear bomb and realized how terrible it is from just the sheer cost to humanity, not the specific tactical utilization of it. Right. And that's uh, that's that that's that's I think that's that's what makes it such a striking movie. And that's when I talk about like what this movie has to say and the conversations it wants to have. There are broader implications to everything going on in Oppenheimer that this movie isn't interested in talking about because there are books and documentaries and it, when I use the word dry, even drier ways of absorbing oh, yeah. that sort of information. And is it any given film's responsibility to dissect and like express that information to broader audiences? What? And would it have reached as broad of an audience if it was something that was trying to get that information across? Well, it's an interesting thing because I, I've, I've the, one of the bigger, and I haven't seen a ton of this, but I've seen some think pieces, and and this is in some ways both the 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 good and bad of the of the internet allowing so many people platforms is is that there's just there's always going to be a billion perceptions of a movie sure. is what I'm saying. You'll so I'm not saying opinions. this is wrong. Yeah per se but it's one i i do push back on a little bit and and some people have pointed out the lack of development of the female characters in the movie and this movie not being enough about the women or them getting short shrift my argument there only being that it is about oppenheimer and so i've seen a lot of i've read a whole article that somebody wrote about oh the disservice to the woman that florence Pugh plays because she was actually a really complex and interesting woman there were all these intricacies i'm like i'm sure there are and you could probably make a movie about her but this movie is already three hours long, so yes, agreed. The kind of we only get to know her through Oppenheimer, but we only get to know every character through Oppenheimer. Right. I don't know that. I mean, there's always a conversation to be had, and it's certainly interesting too. This article was specifically going, but then look at the way that Barbie portrays Ken as an as an equally important character. It's like, yeah, but Barbie's a totally different film, not just in tone, but structure as a screenplay. Like it's right. it's. 
it's an interesting thing. I mean, representation is an is an interesting conversation, but to pretend there's no nuance in it or that all films need to be all things all the time. And I actually think the women are well written in as much as they're given. Yeah, and I think one of the larger broader criticisms of Nolan throughout his career has been his inability to uh portray interesting female characters a lot of the times they are just either like emotional punching bags or uh exposition dump characters and i think this is one of the best movies that doesn't like have both of those be true uh but it also sort of does and so you can kind of lump it in with a lot of the criticisms well um well i have seen that too where they go to like typical nolan and I'm not here to continue those expressions. What, I'm just here to no, say, like, and this I, and is I'm a movie to... called Oppenheimer. And it really, <laughs> it really, more than most movies, is pretty singular in perspective, once again, except for the sequences with Strauss, which I argue, though, the real arc of those sequences go to one of the, 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 the kind of uh, unheralded MVPs of this movie to me is Alden Ehrenreich mm. as the, the unnamed aid to Strauss. Yeah, when Han really... Solo showed up, I was pretty surprised. <laughs> He's to talk to Iron Man of all people. I know, yeah. Well, yeah, that's the thing now is like almost everybody in this movie is a superhero or sci-fi icon of some kind, right? <laughs> I can't figure out where the Scarecrow is in here. And Yeah, yeah uh, but, I wasn't uh, rooting for the Scarecrow to make the nuclear bomb at all in this film. I kept waiting <laughs> that for seems like to show up. That seems like a bad idea, man. Um, he's gonna. He, no wonder he was trying to spread fear everywhere. Um, yeah. No. Uh, that. But but his character being sort of the audience surrogate to Strauss, who is, you know, as close to a pure villain as the movie's gonna have, mm-hmm. and even still, he has nuance and humanity to him. But the idea that it's through Alden Ehrenreich that we're going like, oh, what is this guy's deal? And you're like, oh wait, you're being a huge piece of shit, aren't you? And mm-hmm. he, and I think he does a great job of playing that sort of like, well, I'm just here to assist this guy, and yes, sir, I serve you because I'm a you know bureaucrat with the government, and then eventually just being like, oh God, what the fuck did you do? And then, kind of by the end, almost going like, you know, he doesn't expressly say it, but it almost seems like, yeah, it's it, it's good you're not in the cabinet because mm-hmm. you kind of suck, man. No, and I think one of the goals of this movie is to like highlight how the end of Oppenheimer's life, like post bomb, like that's the, the emotional and like psychological peak of the movie is the, the use of the bombs. But the idea that somebody that important would sort of be ground into bureaucratic mold by people like straws uh, after the fact. It's so interesting. The movie is is concerned with right from the moment go the th- i mean i almost think that the third act of the movie might be the most interesting part of the film once the bombs have been dropped and and oppenheimer's uh uh you know doing that because the movie still goes on for another i don't know 45 minutes or something after the completion of the bomb yeah. uh and 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 you see that is this guy who was uh simultaneously celebrated and vilified as needed by the government perception, right? It's like he's both a scapegoat and the father of the atom, and they show the Time magazine cover that's very mm-hmm. famous and stuff like that. Uh, it's so fascinating. Uh, the, all that stuff is so interesting. I saw one, one of the worst takes I saw in this movie, and I won't credit it, but uh, if you've ever heard me talk about that, there's someone I consider to be the worst film critic in America. Um, <laughs> I don't need to platform him anymore, but sure, I've mentioned yeah, his yeah. name a few times on here. But anyway, his take was, this movie's too long. They should have cut out the beginning and the end of the movie because the Manhattan Project part is the most interesting. And I'm like, you, you're you destroying the entire point of the movie if you do that. You're if you're just a, talking about, yeah. like, that's the most... That's getting to that thing, right, where you're, you're talking about, like, he goes, well, that's the most exciting part of the movie. And you're mm-hmm. like, well, the, the movie would have no impact then. Then in that case, do go watch that movie, Fat Man and the Little Boy, where the main character is the Matt Damon character, and it's literally just about assembling the pieces of this thing. Yeah. That's not... that that I would not be interested in that movie particularly. No, and I think that misses the point of what this movie is trying to get across which is the it, it is trying to get across this idea of one man who is in or can feel so insignificant while also being so important right right he, by a singular context of being the guy at the center of the manhattan project 
is one of the most important people in the history of the human species because his mm -hmm. ability to pull together people and create this device which allowed us the ability to erase ourselves from existence. Right. But at the and, same and... time, everything else is so much bigger than him. Right. And 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 so much of the movie is about him reckoning with the realization of how big what he's done is because, you know, not <laughs> not to use the word myopic, um, but we were using it. But <laughs> but it is sort of this idea about when you're in the 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 rush and the the singular focus of being at Los Alamos as part of the Manhattan Project. It's just about how do we do this? What do we do? We got to figure this out. We got to do the math. We got to do the build. We got to do this thing. It's only upon its actual aftermath once it's been done that you're like jesus christ what are we i mean it's almost like a frankenstein movie to a certain extent right and that's totally. sort of like what if what have i wrought on the world in the moment i was just so excited about the science and also there's there's some really interesting then threads that i'm always fascinated by with sort of the idea about like science is about pure understanding in this intellectual thing it's only once other people get their hands on it that the uh morality of it comes into it right it is sort of like He's 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 working in science, and then somebody else goes, yeah, and we'll use that knowledge to kill people. It's all about coulda, not shoulda. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, there's very much there. It, it, basically, any Crichton novel you can see, <laughs> we'll deal with this. Um, let's talk about Barbie. We've talked a lot about Oppenheimer. There, we have. About Barbie. I, I wanted to segue over because I think it's so interesting that Oppenheimer uses this dual narrative of yeah. straws and Oppenheimer and going back and forth between those like varied timelines to tell the story of a person who is kind of ground into ignominy dis despite being such this important icon yeah. and Barbie at the same time is talking about this icon who is also coming to terms with the fact that she isn't this great icon that can be appreciated and loved and lauded and understanding the humanness of what she represents it, it, that's where the duality with these two things come into play for me in terms of like both are about singular persons who are at the center of their universe. And then once they are shown the full scale of what they have wrought, they become crushed by it in a certain way. I mean, to a certain extent, I think I think the 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 Barbie thing about obviously just beyond it's not dealing in such uh you know uh, uh apocalyptic stakes is also dealing with the things in a in a in a more uh um like where it leaves the movie once again like i said it's not it's not a refugiation of barbie as much as it is a uh, uh examination that are we are we limiting what barbie can represent like as as a world right like it's sort of thing is like barbie is what we put on her but also the acknowledgement that Barbie is, like you said, what we put on her, but an avatar. She is a yeah, right. platonic ideal of whatever we choose it to be. She is not, quote unquote, human. Right, exactly. And, Bar and, and Barbie, but... the character, doesn't need to go see a gynecologist until the end of the film. Right, yes, which is very funny. <laughs> Them shouting at cops, we don't have genitals. It's one of the funniest very, movie very funny. lines I've ever heard. Yeah. I mean, the movie is all, I mean, the, I think in some ways that's why I also want to, like, when people talk about, there's so many interesting and, and, and big philosophical themes in Barbie, but it's also just, it's really funny. It's really a fun, fun movie. So I do think some, some of the conversation around Barbie, and obviously I don't have to worry about this because the movie's raking in money, but it is sort of just like, yeah, but don't, like, don't reduce it to that or don't make it seem like this movie isn't a blast to watch. Um, because I do think there's some some of the conversations gotten so serious it's like also you're meant to laugh at it too. Also, like it, it is a comedy, and that's why it's such a strong counterpoint to Oppenheimer that mm -hmm. is so serious and so like contemplative. Whereas Barbie almost tricks you into like well, I thinking think about these larger things. I think it's something comedy has done forever, right? Oh, sure. comedy yeah. in some ways can actually get more at the truth of things than right. than drama right it's sort of the point is that there i think it's very interesting and 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 uh i've seen people talk to nolan about this is of course the 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 something like dr strangelove which is a, a comedy that's getting mm -hmm. at some of the same themes and him talking about it, he goes i had to i had to purposely avoid thinking about dr strangelove when putting oppenheimer together um <laughs> because i i didn't want to invoke any of that that might 
you know damage kind of the 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 seriousness of this movie by invoking some of the Doctor Strange love imagery or tone that is in the culture. Well, first things first, he dodged a bullet. Slim Pickens has passed. Can't have him yep. in the movie. Good call. Yeah, and I know he's like, damn, that's the one thing I would have put in if I could have. But um, <laughs> no, the 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 thing the thing that's so so good about Barbie is, in some ways, it's getting at broader themes. Um, or, or it's expressing them in, in a broader capacity because well, it's it's dealing more overtly in iconography. Yes. It is also more expressly about a specific human experience that 50% of the population has, which is being a woman and how women see themselves, right? Although Where, I, I think the thing, uh, th- and then that's the other thing about it, though, is I think it actually is just as much about men, which is one of the geniuses of the script. It it is. And I think that's what I was saying earlier about something that the film itself avoids spoiling in such a huge way is how strong the Ken story is in the Barbie film. It really is a two-hander in that way. And and it's a great example of, and I'm not surprised, Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach wrote this movie. And that was my whole thing, is I didn't care about a Barbie movie. And then when they said these two were writing and she was directing, I'm going, well, fine, I'll see that because I'll see anything they do. I think they're geniuses. And it, it is the out-of-left-field choice. Now, like I said, now getting Lena Dunham to Polly Pocket, now that's becoming, oh, the out-of-left-field choice is now the mainstream choice to do mm-hmm. that. But the idea of getting two indie filmmakers who make kind of melancholy comedies, if not straight drama to uh, approach something like Barbie is so interesting. And you see that in that, in that they are coming at it from being just really good character writers. And so they're, they're they're telling this sort of split narrative that's getting at this larger theme. And the thing is, whenever people talk about this movie is, is feminist. Sure. It is feminist, but it's feminist in an equality way because what's attacking is the patriarchy. It's not Mm -hmm. attacking men. And I think, one of the biggest things I see in conversation about this movie, particularly from people who lean more in a right-wing direction, is they think when people are talking about patriarchy, they're talking about men, and they're not. I mean, they're talking about a masculine concept, which is in the patriarchy. But I think one of the things that I was so struck by about this movie and why I think it is having such universal appeal is this movie is about how men are also victims of the patriarchy, and yeah. that's the problem. And I, and that's the thing with the Ken storyline and I'm saying it now. I'm not the first one to say it. I've seen other people. If Gosling doesn't get an Academy Award nomination for this movie, then I don't, because it is one of the best performances I've seen in years in this film. I mean, Margot Robbie's amazing too, and has so much of the heavy lifting to do in a lot of the arc stuff. But you talk about just barreling into the full commitment to it, which is always one of the reasons Gosling's one of my favorite actors. But holy shit, is he just 100% in on this? It's so easy to write him off as a pretty boy, or or it was. I don't think that's the case anymore. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of the thing we talked about with Josh Hartnett, too. But yeah, like, these guys were presented as heartthrobs. Right, and and don't if you don't have the context of the rest of his career, I think it's very easy to see how obvious of a casting choice he is at Ken. But the the genius... Uh, galaxy brain level here is that he is also such a committed character actor which is stuff you've seen in like drive and blade runner and a lot of his like later career films the nice guys is one of my favorite performances of his and you talk about something that's very broadly comedic um he is no he is he is i think many of my favorite actors are uh, character actors in their heart who are cursed with leading men good lucks i always think of brad pitt (laughs) as this a guy as one of these guys, Brad Pitt so badly wants to play weirdos, you know, <laughs> but they're always like, yeah, but look at you, you're so goddamn handsome. I think I think a, a guy who uh, I've also talked about loving this firm, firmly on the uh, ascent, and I totally see having a similar career to Gosling is Pattinson with that, right? Like mm. that guy burst on the scene. They put him in Twilight going, he's really hunky. And you get the sense he's like, no, I want to be weird. <laughs> he he got to be Batman eventually, so it's well. Funny. I do like that where he t- literally he had the story about when he said his agents were like, "Why would you want to go up for Batman? I thought you only wanted to play weirdos." He goes, "He's the ultimate weirdo. He's such a weird character." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the ideas that Barbie is trying to express about patriarchy and how so many people conflate 
that with just being a man in the same way that Barbie is conflated with being a woman. The the, the gender politics that this movie right. is dealing in is such a universal thing that any human can like kind of grapple with even if you don't necessarily assign yourself like the gender labels of man or woman or boy or girl or like you can grapple yeah, the, with the idea of what society sees you as that's it and it's not talking being about, put into a box that way it's talk yeah it's talking about gender expectations and specifically in that way and 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 also as the movie points out the idea that the, the, the ones that have been omnipresent for decades right and and the movie expresses that through this idea that and it's true barbie is you know what 60 70 years old now uh, as as far as, uh, as a brand. as a toy line yeah um and there really is no male equivalent to it i know people bring up like gi joe was designed to be the male equivalent to it but there's never been anything as omnipresent in terms of a singular presentation of masculinity in that field i don't think well, it's because, and again, this comes down to a gender politics thing in some ways, is that Barbie was meant to be the replacement of the baby doll, right? And the beginning of which this movie sort of like great. addresses that in its pastiche of 2001. Love which it. I fucking love, love. everything about that, man. That is so... <laughs> That is so great. There was I, some... In my theater watching Barbie, there was like this older, like... 60 70 something like older guy sitting next to me who was like clearly an old school film nerd and when it busts in with like yeah. 2001 right at the start of this movie he dies laughing well that's because once again that's the benefit you get when you hire real real filmmakers real film enthusiasts who love cinema to make this right is it's not is it's not just made by like goofy people who go let's make fun barbie movie and i said i think from the sound of it that's kind of the movie warner brothers was talking about making for years we're going oh, like sure. isn't barbie dumb let's make fun of how stupid barbie is and then here you have people who are really contemplating barbie in all of its complexity uh and what it represents and also is a really good director who uh is partnered with this also this other amazing filmmaker and they wrote this together um uh, and and there are there are there are a couple in real life as well um and it's it's just it's it's at every turn i'm just i i applaud the movie and i kept thinking almost with every beat in the film i just went what a smart decision right mm -hmm. i just going like god that's a good take on that but at least where toys are concerned there is no "Quote unquote boy equivalent." Of no, there's more. There's more trends. That. You have like the yeah. war toys and things like that. But that that's more broadly focused. Barbie and the interesting thing about Barbie is, rather than creating a new thing, it was always just they would just sort of reinvent Barbie, right? Yeah. You know, you would see that, and that's kind of what the that's the fun of the movie too. And I think one of the great decisions is this idea that uh, Margot Robbie is playing stereotypical Barbie. But it's in a world where every Barbie is a is a Barbie, and every Ken is a Ken. These are the versions of this thing. It is a it is a uh, almost like a, a a community or a race or something within it, rather than it is uh, that there is Barbie and Ken. It is like no, no, they are. I mean, Ken does beach. Ryan Gosling's Ken does beach, <laughs> which is one of the funniest jokes in the movie. Uh, and I've seen so many shirts now of people going, "I do beach." Um, <laughs> And it is just like, because that's what it says on his box. He's Beach Ken. Yeah. He's not Surfer so. Ken. Uh -uh. He's not Different Surfer Ken. Ken. He's not He's not Lifeguard Ken. Different Ken. He's Beach Ken. <laughs> and that's and, and, and it's so fun. And then you have, um, oh, God, I love Simu Liu so much as, I, I don't know, you know he's, he's just a little bit better Ken, or at least a little bit more secure Ken. He, and that drives our main Ken. 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 Yeah, and that drives our Ryan Gosling can insane. <laughs> I absolutely one of the like uh, bits of cognitive dissonance I had watching this uh, movie was uh, Kingsley Benadire as uh, oh yeah Ken's best friend Ken because he's also yeah. playing the main bad guy in Secret Invasion right now. Yeah, two radically different performances <laughs> that are happening kind of simultaneously here. What a what a what a talented dude he is. I'm I'm so. Uh, and he's got, uh, I, I've seen the trailer now a billion times at movies for his Bob Marley biopic, which I'm uh, hesitant about as I'm hesitant about all music biopics. But sure. that guy is an astounding actor. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, the other Ken who hangs out with them, the one with the sort of bleached hair, is going to be the new Doctor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I totally so they, didn't catch that. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't have a lot to do, but he gets some funny lines here and there because he sort of has the cadre of of uh, of other Kens who are right. his boys. That's where, like, talking about this movie starts to become difficult because everyone is named Barbie or Ken except, except for, for Alan. <laughs> except for Alan. <laughs> it's just one uh, Alan. Michael, Michael Sarah. Sarah, Such a gem. <laughs> yeah, that dude... I feel like there was a brief period of time where Hollywood kind of forgot how great he is, and I feel like they've totally re-embraced him again. Because mm-hmm. you talk about uh, just a guy who is such a singular comedic presence. Yeah. Like, he has such a thing. And there is, I almost feel like it's it's the kind of thing that people talk about where in scripts they will write, like, so-and-so, and then as a shorthand for casting, they'll go, like, a Michael Sarah type. And that is a type that c- keeps in mind there is something about the Michael Sarah type. Yeah, it's, his name is Jesse Eisenberg. Um. <laughs> well, I mean, th- th- there there is that too, right? I mean, there is sort of that thing. And uh, uh, he was another guy who purposely stepped away for a while. I was like, I don't really know if I like what's coming my way, so I'll step away and then come back. And boy, does he crush literally every scene he's in. He just yeah. crushes it every time he's on screen. Michael it's Sarah, a killer. not Jesse Eisenberg. Well, he's also great too, but he's just not in this movie. Just not uh, in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, just a, a quick note. Check out his directorial debut, uh, When You Finish Saving the World, Jesse Eisenberg. Uh, mm. Really good, absolutely tiny indie film that is worth checking out. Really good. Mm. Um, anyway. Uh, but yeah, uh, M- Michael Sarah as Alan. Uh, an- another character in this movie who's just like, every single character in this movie is installed to like, analyze a perspective of like how we see ourselves right alan is the guy yeah. who gets looked over because he's not a ken and everyone well, kind of goes eh, whenever which they is talk so about perfect him. because literally when alan was introduced in the toy line he the entire the entire thing with him is he's a different guy who can also wear ken's clothes <laughs> so your ken clothes can also go on alan who's just a different man Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ken is already a totally ill-defined man. Here's an even less defined man who's right. the same size as Ken. Like that's basically what it was. Was Ken needed a friend, so they made Alan. Right. Well, and all the Barbies are just as ill-defined, right? Like whether you have President yeah. Barbie or well, they're a singularly Bobby defined, or... right? That's sort yeah. of the thing where it's just like President Barbie is President, physicist Barbie is physicist, reporter Barbie is reporter Barbie. You know, like, it's that sort of thing where it's like. The idea that every new Barbie incarnation is just another person in this world who is singularly defined by the one thing they are. As opposed to stereotypical Barbie who is just... Barbie. Yeah, and that's why she's the... I mean, that's why it works so well for her to be the one having the emotional crisis of what am I even? At least these women have a singular thing that defines them. I'm just a lady. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Her, her... She is defined by she is Barbie. And yeah, everyone has defi- this idea in their head of what that means, except yep. for Barbie, which is such a good take to get into the center of the emotionality right. of this film. Yeah, it's like it's like this, all she. The only things we really know about her, she has the. By the way, uh, set design on this movie is insane. The oh, way that they you, built the Barbie dream house. You talk about practical like set building. Yeah. Like Oppenheimer, sure they built Los Alamos. They built well, the Barbie dream house. I mean, what's interesting is both of these movies are using practical effects, but in totally different ways. Whereas Oppenheimer is t- is trying to get to incredibly f- minute detail reality. This movie is using practicality to get to complete artificiality. It's all shot on sound stages. Everything is built. It's so interesting to see these are two movies that are both returning to old style. I mean, uh, Greta Gerwig has talked a lot about... Um, the influence of like MGM musicals of the 1950s mm. and things like oh, that, mean, that were these candy colored, technicolored, otherworldly films. That was those like MGM style musicals were exactly running through my head when we get to yeah. the Mattel offices and all of yep. the executives are like running back and forth through the cubicles. And yep. like, there were definitely going to be people in the audience being like, well, why are they just like purposefully avoiding bar rooms? Like, no, they're evoking something here and it's a well, filmmaking I think, thing. I think that's also a key thing that I've seen some of the, the once again, very uh, minority amount of, uh, uh, of uh, criticism of this movie um, from like the usual suspects. Uh, sure. But uh, um, the, the idea being that I think one of the things they 
they don't understand i've seen some other people argue this is the real world is still a cartoon vision of the real world to make a point for the movie it's yes. not meant to literally be our world because yes the mattel ceo which by the way of course you just will ferrell's will ferrelling all over this and it's great which is why some of the parallels to the Lego movie are drawn so specifically around Will Ferrell yes. as well. Yes. But the other thing I love is, and I think the that's the thing too, where it's getting at the, the, the larger context of the patriarchy. It would have been so easy to turn Will Ferrell into the villain of this movie. And he's really not, there really is no villain in the movie. It's all just sort of, it is the, the conceptual patriarchy that is the, the villain the true villain are the shackles we place upon ourselves. Because I do love his realization. I love his thing too. Where he goes like, well, I just want girls to be able to be whatever they want to, man. Sure, I want to sell units, but you know, it's also, I think it's good, you know. Uh, well, obviously, I love the there's a more cynical take there because the guy with the clipboard behind him says like, oh yeah, but this will make us money. <laughs> yeah, well, I do love that where it's like, what about Barbie with real problems? Like, that won't sell. Actually, sir, it will. Great. Yeah, and that's the thing. But I mean, and and that is, but that is so true, right? He is the representation of the corporation, which has no morality. It is mm -hmm. just about what sells. So if that happens to coincide with something that we can look at and say is good for society, then they're hundred percent on it. I just saw somebody talking about that with Pride, right? And the whole thing about all these corporations getting on Pride, they're like, of course it's cynical, and and they're just trying to make a profit. But at least it happens to be them making a profit off of something that is objectively good. Yeah. That's better than when it wasn't. Right. The corporations Pro are going to be progress. corporations. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like corporations are always going to want to make money. The best we can hope for is it happens to line up with something that's actually good for society. And honestly, the idea that large corporations are lining up behind something that we perceive as good for society is actually a sign that there is a majority stake in good. Yep. <laughs> because and I think it'll that sell is... to a majority. And I think that... That is to get into the, I mean, I guess to, to touch briefly on sort of the larger thing, I do feel like that loud minority rage against this movie is an indication that the those are, that's a dying voice. Yeah, no. It, one of the, the most... Those are the loudest are because they're literally screaming death rattles. Right. The most inspiring thing to me about this movie is the fact that for weeks now, because this movie came out, what, two weeks ago? Yeah, um, as a recording of this, yeah. As a recording. But I am still consistently seeing crowds of people dressed in yeah. day glow and pink yeah. showing up to, in support of this film. And There's it is something, this is really this is like magical a, about that. It's a movie, I mean, it, it, you know, this happens every once in a while with movies, right? Like, every once in a while, there's just a movie that's, like, the right movie at the right time for the culture. And I think that's very much what this is. It's this has touched on something, and not only touched on it in themes, but has found a way to present it that just really is connecting with what people need right now. That, that you know, we wouldn't have been able to say that. I, you know, it, it wouldn't have been like, nobody's sitting around going, you know what we really need right now? It's a Barbie movie. to get. But it's just like, when you see it, you go, yeah. People needed this right now. It's the same thing with it was very much the case with 1989 with Batman, uh, right? Or or you know whatever stuff like that where it's just like it just dominates culture because it's just for whatever reason that's it right now. That's that's a perfect movie for our time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that is very and so that makes sense. It's just like people just dig. I think the Lego Movie had a little bit of that when it came out too. Like there was just sort of this feeling of like, wow, this is getting at something. That we can all recognize in a unique way. Well, the Barbie movie has the benefit of, like you said, like reacting to something that we all perceive as this loud, angry voice rebelling against, quote unquote, woke culture, whatever you want to right. call it. But this idea of equality and expressing yourself in a way that you now feel comfortable in your own skin is seen as weak or wrong by a very loud minority and the idea yeah. that that minority is a minority is now sinking into the culture that that it doesn't represent some 50 percent margin it is this shouting angry echo chamber that is slowly getting quieter and quieter while the rest of us are dressing in pink and going to see barbie and it's fucking great yeah or you can the other thing too is just like 
or you can just not see it and not say anything. You know, like that's the thing too. You just go like, I don't, that's what I just don't understand is the idea of not liking something to the point of going like, and you need to hear about it. Well, because like, that gets back to the cynicism of it in that so far as those sorts of angry YouTube videos, the sort you torture yourself with John Campbell. <laughs> I do, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, cause well, cause I'm, I, I do, I do want to, hear that when i come on here and 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 rail against it i want to hear what their points are they usually don't have very good ones but but it's sort of yeah it, it is like i said an echo chamber in which the people who feed into that are looking for uh eyeballs because that's how they get paid that's yep. how they make a living and the expression of anger and rage for some reason, the people who have made the internet algorithms, that is like how it feeds into that. And so the the expression of anger sells more than people just saying, yeah, and I like it. But at the end of the day, what we all want to feel isn't anger. It is, I liked it. I had fun. It was good. I think, And I think that's the thing is most people just go like, oh, hey, yeah, nice. And, and I think a lot of people are enjoying it and connecting with it in a way that isn't that is uh and i think this is movies at their best obviously that they're not even they're not even expressing it they don't even know they're not looking at going like this movie represents my political opinion they're just going like i like this and they're not necessarily thinking but it's because they are tacitly agreeing with it right they are going yeah. this is reflecting something back to me but i think people like us though we're doing it right now because we have microphones in front of us and we have to fill time <laughs> on the show but i'm saying i think for for for, for more people like us that we just go like yeah that was good it's the people who have to disagree with it who have to go rah, rah, you know like i just there, there's and also i think the other thing with those people and something when you talk about seeing this echo chamber of it is it, it, it's just like once you start being angry about this thing this thing it starts to be then you're just angry about everything right because now you've just yeah. put yourself into this headspace and that's the thing i get is like it's like man i just I, for the most part i don't spend a lot of time about stuff i don't like i just go oh i, I didn't watch it I, I that didn't seem interesting to me yeah. i don't spend a lot of time being mad about things i don't like you don't see it's me fine. getting angry that horror movies exist i just don't <laughs> engage with them Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, that's it exactly. That's the thing, and it's just like, and 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 I'm always, all the, of course, always the opinion is always, well, if it's not hurting anybody, who cares, man? Like, whatever. People like, there's tons of stuff I just I don't get. I just don't get. What do you see in that? I don't get it. But then I just move on and just go like, once again, it's. I always come back to sincerity. If you sincerely like something, I can't really argue with you about it. I can just say it's not for me. It's yeah. the it is kind of the thing you're talking about though with the negative reviews where it's like you seem insincere. You, yeah. This doesn't seem and whether or not once again it's sort of like and also then of course you get into the stuff where you have people trying to go well politics aside objectively from it no no like don't get in because also <laughs> not true if we're gonna play the like screenplay structure game holy shit is Barbie a good script like just if you're just going to build the building blocks of it it is a really well constructed screenplay by two people who are very good at this well and it's so smart in the way that it's constructed because it is this like there and back again story that is yeah. as old as stories right like well that's the thing there's there's a beauty to and this is something i've definitely uh in in a lot of the the movies coming out and, and listening to conversations about films something it's something i've really come to respect it's like there is something beautiful in the simplicity of films oftentimes like sometimes you can really end up destroying your movie by trying to be too clever or go like i'm gonna do a thing nobody's seen before and you're like well actually a lot of this stuff uh works for a reason and like you're talking about in this case it's a very simple structure that we've seen before but it's the execution of it that makes it new and different and fun well and it's almost new and different and fun because it is even going so far as to address its simplicity when you pull sure. down a map of the world and you just hand wave and say it's a portal is it eh, don't worry about it just you follow from here to here to here that's how you get to the world and how do you get back you do it in reverse <laughs> and it's fun it doesn't matter how any of that works because it's just fun to watch them do it seeing ryan gosling hang off the fin of a rocket is just it's funny and it's fun and the movie always is keeping that in mind even when it's making its serious points it's always going like how do we present it in a fun entertaining engaging way that everybody's gonna i do think you can take your kids to this movie and i think you should in a lot if, if your kids want to go to movies by yeah. the way if your kids aren't going to behave themselves in a movie theater 
don't fucking take your kids to this is this is where I'm actually up in arms about. <laughs> I will say that we I've been going to a lot of movies this summer, whether we've been talking about them or whatever, and I, mm-hmm. I am so disillusioned in the general audience that goes to films because they don't want to engage with the movie, period. And that is uh, making me not want to go to the theater anymore. And that is driving me up the wall, I will say. That is a more fascinating thing about the theater experience. And I think Barbie is an interesting cross-section of that specifically because it is a film that begs you to engage with it because it is taking you on this day glow adventure and like getting in its political point of view while we're doing it in such a ingenious way. But if you're just there for the cultural moment and trying to be a part of the zeitgeist, tell that to the five teenagers who were sitting next to me at the movie that I was ready to murder. <laughs> And I think there are a lot of people who are maybe engaging with the movie in that way. They are par- they want to be a part of the meme, right? The, yeah, that's exactly what the, these people next to me. There was a guy next to me who kept having to react to me like, Oh, no, no, no! Oh, oh, oh you do this! Throughout the movie. It's like, <laughs> shut up! My God! Hey, look at the... No, they're not gonna. They're not gonna! Ah! And it's like, God but- damn it! But I appreciate that. As obnoxious as oh, that can be. Oh, come on. Come on. You can't appreciate that. Oh, let me finish my sentence. Tim. All right. All I'll right. appreciate that over somebody who's going into the theater only to be in the theater of Barbie in that moment. As opposed to someone who's completely unengaged, having their phone out, having a different conversation with somebody in the chair next to them. I'll appreciate oh, someone genuinely having yeah. over reactions to a mm-hmm. film in the moment as opposed to being completely disassociating with what's in front of them yeah but that this is a guy who's drawing attention to himself you know i mean i i think it's part of the same my perception of this was this is a guy who's like i want to get laughs i would be angrier at that if you and i had both not been that person 15 20 years ago well (laughs) sure but i don't know i mean i i still feel like we were more respectful than that um no, I th- we were legitimately clowning on certain films when we went and saw Robert Zemeckis' Beowulf in theaters. And well, I know f- that is not exactly on the same level of cinema as I'm Barbie. Just talking, maybe that, I, mean, I think that's a little bit what I'm talking about, too, is we did sort of... I, I felt like there was a general vibe... A lot, I don't know. There was a general vibe uh, uh, that, um, that, that everybody was a little bit clowning on, like, Clash of the Titans... Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. It's pre- it's impossible. But whatever. Either way, I Let have... Let those I have, who have I, not clowned on movies cast the first stone. Sure. Uh, I will say, uh, just another... Uh, you can go watch... Uh, actually, if you there's a, here's just a plug for one of our other videos there. If you go watch Michael Lisman and I's review of uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, <laughs> there was a woman next to us who shushed us for talking during the trailers. Okay, that's no. You don't the trailer that no. You can watch those on she YouTube. Literally, Get out of here. She literally turned to us and said, "Could you not? I can't hear the movie." And there was a Coca Cola commercial playing. At that point, you turned to her and say, "It's not the movie yet." <laughs> yeah, I know that was really. And she made and it was and then and then and this is all. If you go watch that, if you've watched it, I'm sorry you've heard the story. But then she spent the last half hour of the movie looking at her phone. So you talk about let those without sin cast the first stone. There you go right there on that one. Are you kidding me? Just because you're brought face to face with the avatar of hypocrisy next to you, John. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, I'm just saying there, there's been the, the last several movie experiences. These aren't have started to compound on me being really upset with. The, I had people I saw, I saw Oppenheimer in a fully packed theater. Same. like in a, but, but like I saw it at the the. the if, in Portland, Oregon here, I highly recommend the Hollywood Theater. So in an yeah. old-style movie house where there were like 200-plus people, I saw it uh, on 70 millimeter, And I thought, well, here, we're all coming here to see. And there's still people cackling at stuff. Um, a lot of laughs and often There are people over-laughing at stuff because the movie is witty. There are things where Nolan scripts are always kind of like this, where there are lines where you go like, hmm, like mm-hmm. that guy said something clever. But people are going, oh, <laughs> And then, of course, you got the people going, uh, uh, you know, anytime there's some kind of, like, 
I, for lack of a better word, burn, or anytime somebody gets the better of someone in like an argument, you got that guy going, whoa, whoa. Yeah, and I, even in my audience, which I, for the most part was very respectful, there were yeah. definitely a few people who was like, anytime Florence Pugh was naked, everyone was like, yeah. woo. Yeah, that's, that's really, <laughs> that really yeah. is, come on, man. That can be very grating. <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of stuff. Luckily, I didn't have that, I think, because it was an older audience. But you also have the just, and, 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 and I, I'm respectful of this, but it's just the, the, the frustration. Some very old people who were, like, struggling physically to, like, just engage, you know, because you got to get up several times during the movie. They can't help that, but it is sort of just an interesting thing where you, you just think about things when you're going out to the movies. <laughs> well, it's this communal experience, and the idea that you want to participate in it is an overriding feature of um, we talked about this at the top of the episode wanting yeah. to engage in this collective experience is a driving factor in a lot yeah. of us right now and that's why like being a part of the barbie meme is the i think thought I process now... there it is not necessarily yeah. to want to go see a movie it's be a part of something larger yeah and the fact and that that's... we were denied that for three years is why we have this outpour or it's part of why we have this outpouring of and wanting i think to be I a have... part of something I think I have now reached my limit of the communal experience. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to less movies. Um, just You're the that. guy who's like, I miss lockdown. <laughs> well, there is a part of me that's like, I just want to, I like watching a movie at home when I no one else is here and I can listen to it properly, you know, like with my headphones on, <laughs> watching my movie. Because I really care about the movie. That's sort of the thing. It is yeah. It is sort of something I've thought about is, and that's 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 no... But it is kind of like um, I will go out for some stuff, but let me say I'm, I'm I'm definitely going to the movies less now, just because I really just do care about the movie, and I found that that it, it, it's not not that it was ever like a uh, 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 you know experience that everybody was in agreement on. This has always been part of it, but I do feel like post um, sort of the lockdowns, people have gotten. V- very comfortable like uh, in a way i think did i talk about that when we did indiana jones that the guy next to me at that kicked his shoes off and he was sitting yeah. there barefoot what are you what what are you doing <laughs> pete there has been a loss of shame over the last <laughs> oh i'm gonna say since uh november 2016 um in <laughs> uh american there's a real, civilization there's a great pete holmes bit about this and it and it's and it's something I'm really thinking that there's this human impulse of nobody tells me what to do, and so it is. Like, I saw I also at Barbie there was a woman uh, down the row from me, but I saw that she had, she had gotten nachos from the thing, and she was literally every time she went to get a nacho, she turned the flashlight on her phone, looked at the nacho to eat it off, on off. So just throughout the whole movie, ah ah ah, I, flashlight. I don't- and I don't, yeah, that's incredibly disrespectful in a theater, and I don't know that woman's situation. She might have had a nacho uh, incident in the past that requires extra <laughs> amounts of safety. I mean, it, it could be, but even still, I, what I'm saying is there seems to just be a lack of, my biggest thing is, I don't want to, you know, besmirch on anyone's enjoyment of things, but like, there seems to be a lack of awareness of people around you that I'm mm. that I'm noticing more and more that is really starting to irk me, where it's just like, I get you think you're being comfortable doing this or you think you're having fun at the movie, but you're not stepping out of yourself to go, oh, there are other people around who might not enjoy that. And maybe we were that once, but you know what? We're not that anymore. And so now I'm the old man going, shut up, kid. <laughs> Although I was kind of, you, you've known me long enough now, I was kind of always that old man to a sure. certain extent. And look, I'm the guy who will confront somebody in a theater, and I know a lot of I people can, don't want I, to I do that. I will say, I haven't either. That kid at Barbie, I came damn close to. That is the closest I've ever come to going, are you Are you kidding me? The only thing I thought about it was because he was younger, it might look bad, and there was no, I'm like, I don't want to fight this kid's dad. <laughs> Whereas I have turned to teenagers uh, as recently as Little Mermaid and been like, look, if you're not here to watch the movie, please leave. Yeah. And that is that that is fair. Also, though, you are more prepared to fight the dads than I am, I think. I, I, I would die in a fight. Um, <laughs> you don't need to fight any dads. You're in a I don't need to space. fight any dads, but there's always that thought. No, there's always that thought, though, that I'm like, this is where I get shot over this now. Is this really worth getting and shot over? That's because another it's... conversation to have about our uh, current <laughs> civilizational benchmarks. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that's also, you know, that's like, that's become a very real threat. So I'm sure. just like, you know what? I'll just complain about this afterwards on my podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to you, that guy in the Barbie theater. I hope you hear this. From podcast heart, I stab at thee. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Exactly. I'm going to be snarky on microphone. And that's now two things I've done where we... <laughs> Backed on that woman at Mission Impossible. I was so just and 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 we we talked about this because part of the reason we talked about it on there is we talked about it for like an hour after we left the movie, just going, were we in the wrong on that? We were also, to be fair, talking about the trailers. Even it wasn't like we were just we were just going like, oh look at this, who's this guy? You know, I don't, I don't know. I feel like that's fine. And I'm I am look, Mister Robook at the movie theaters. But if you want to chat through the trailers, who gives a shit? That is basic. The reason those run as long as they do is so as many people can be seated as possible. Yeah. No. And look, I'll back you up on this one, John. I think that lady was uh, insane. And well, she also I, I, did it in a very rude way too. It wasn't. It wasn't just, hey, could you guys keep it down? We might have respected that, but it was this. Just like, can you not? The phrase. I can't hear the movie when the movie <laughs> hasn't started yet is what yep. really gets me there. Yep. Yep. It was lit. Then that wasn't, that wasn't even a trailer. It was a commercial when she said that too. That right. was really where I'm going. I'm sorry. You need to hear about the, the refreshing taste of diet Coke. Now to play devil's advocate uh -oh, ever God. so slightly. All right. I hate the there, devil though. You know that. Uh, yeah. And he's my man. Um, <laughs> Have taken you that hard anti-devil stance. All right, go ahead. <laughs> have you never been in a theater, sat down during the previews, mm -hmm. and heard some people talking a little rambunctiously and thought to yourself, these people are going to be the problem when the movie starts? Well, sure, sure, yes. So uh, maybe, that, that... maybe this lady had that thought and had the courage to get out in front of it, <laughs> not knowing I, that your sure. attitude would have changed once the film started. I, I think that is valid. I still think tone could be addressed. That's fair. That's fair. Totally fair. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think that's the thing. She, rea she she reacted what would be the third time she had to shush us. That was at the level she started at. Okay. Okay. As opposed that's the to thing, turning to you and saying, hey, y'all aren't going to be talking this loud during the film, right? That Also, that would have been a fair cut. We and then we would have like, oh, absolutely not. But it was literally the first thing she said to us was, can you not? I can't hear the movie that isn't playing yet. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um. that's it. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. So that's just, you know, people, man. I, I yeah. think I have a problem with people. I don't, I've come to, I don't I haven't even come to realize this. I've known this forever. Yeah. Uh, getting back to Barbie a little bit. I know this conversation's yeah. wrapping up. I, yeah. I do want to give Margot Robbie the props she deserves before we leave this film. Oh in, God. Yeah the rear view because i this i don't think this film would be what it is without her at the center of it in terms of like she is championed so much filmmaking i guess for yeah. lack of a better term i mean I, I absolutely i have as much respect for her as a producer as, as an actor the stuff she chooses to get behind uh starting with i Tonya is where i really became like yeah. a massive fan of hers i certainly liked her in wolf of wall street and i like her as harley quinn but that was the first time not only is she incredible in that movie but that movie pretty much wouldn't have existed had she not really backed it and i feel like this is a similar case i don't know all the like backstory behind it but like you don't get a filmmaker like greta gerwig who let's be honest only has two films like major films under her yeah. belt and like and while those have like great critical reception, a studio, especially a large one like Warner Brothers, see that yeah. as an opportunity to push around a smaller, more originally indie filmmaker in a way that definitely... is not apparent in this movie. No, no, no. I mean, uh, uh, Margot Robbie talked about the first time she read the Barbie script. She thought, this is amazing. This will not survive a studio note process. Like, right. we weren't this movie can't be made this way. There's no way. Mm -hmm. So that is, I definitely think her signing as a producer, I think the idea of getting both her and Gosling early, that there's like, okay, there's at least the star power we can sell this on. I truly don't think anybody else could have played Barbie. Not with all the, the capacity of this movie. Not only does she certainly just immediately, like you talk about, both her and Gosling just look right for the part, but they actually have the complexity of performance the ability to play both the serious and comedic levels. Yeah. Um, Gosling's also a singer, which is great for the... Well, I'm Just Ken is a banger. 
I couldn't believe that was actually him. Like, I, I wasn't familiar with his ability to sing before this movie. Oh, you have you weren't you weren't a La La Land fan? Not particularly, no. Yeah, but. I'm not. I'm not super shocked by that. I love that movie. <laughs> Um, he's also an amazing dancer in that too. Um, sure. the man can tap dance. Uh, <laughs> no, but yeah, no, he's, he's great. And once again, though, it is the total conviction to that incredibly silly song that is also, also kind of legitimate and sincere to the song too. Like the whole movie is this very specific tone that a different director, a different set of actors, it could have so gone wrong and fallen either into maudlin or so goofy you can't engage with it territory. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I, that, yeah. And I think that's why I'm saying, like, I can't think of anybody who could physically embody Barbie and be able to play what is asked of her other than Margot Robbie. But at the same time, I really appreciate that this movie has such a density of character types behind the Barbie and Ken as representatives of Barbie and Ken. Something I was yeah. struck by in this film is that we have women as Barbie of every single body type you could mention. And it's never yeah. commented on as a joke. Like the, the oh, most no, no. jokes we get are about the characters not named Barbie and Ken. And I really, really dug that about their presentation of this fantasy world. Well, and also, I mean, it is sort of like it, it, it plays on the idea that that is something the company is trying to do. Once again, whether you think that cynically, and of course, it's just them trying to make money, but there has definitely been a push over the years to go, oh, we'll address the, the, the accusations of sexism or whatever by introducing the rainbow of Barbies. So I think that makes sense, too. It also feels... It, it, it's it's a good thing for the movie. It's a good thing for the representation. And it still fits the brand. It would make sense in the world. So yeah. the if, if I'm saying this to couch the argument is going like, well, now they're just adding every kind of Barbie. It's like, go look at the toy shelf. There's every kind of Barbie. Well, and the, the fact that it is, it's this weird Ouroboros of cynicism, right? Because the mm -hmm. movie is presenting it in a way that is just matter of fact. And the mm -hmm. best way of presenting diversity, which is just like, this is what people look like, <laughs> I, because that's how the world works. But that saw, is a calculated move in yeah. as far as the movie and the brand are concerned well, the, the to whole be movie uncalculating. Is, the whole movie is, right? Mattel produced the movie. So it's, it's, it's like, hey, it's Mattel doing that thing that I think is very much, and once again, I think is corporations are always going to be um, to me, neutral on anything. They are they they endorse no morality really. They are just going whatever the trend is. So right now, like it's hip to have a sense of humor about ourselves. So we'll let these cool filmmakers make a cool movie about us. And they did. Props to them. I don't feel like there was any like them going like, ooh, that's a little too far. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if there was, then I obviously it was it had to have been pretty extreme because the movie definitely is not afraid to make fun of a thing while also celebrating it too. I definitely think the movie loves the whole uh, aesthetic of Barbie and Ken. Of course, it's meant to be fun and enjoyable. Uh, you know, you're not supposed to leave the movie going like, "Yeah, man, I hope they stop selling Barbies because fuck that shit." Right. Exactly. Uh, that, is... And like I said, I also don't want to. I don't think people would like that movie. That would not be fun. No, because it feels too aggressive and morose. And you talk about the cultural moment. This is a movie that, it at the end of the day, is celebrating a brand in a way, yep. while also exploring ideas of how that brand evolved people who engage with it, which was what, totally. part of what makes it so smart. And I think that's the thing where it's like my mom sees trailers for it and goes like, I want to see that. I loved my Barbies as a kid. And I think my mom would love the movie. My mom won't set foot in a theater. And once again, as I've just gone through, I can't blame her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but it is sort of a thing where it's like, yeah, that is a thing. I think I think you I, I feel like that's Greta Gerwig. I've never I don't know if that's specifically her experience, but it does feel like it's written by somebody who like America Ferrera's character, who is sort of our audience surrogate, right? Yeah. In, in a lot of ways, is somebody who has very fond memories of her Barbies, but also can reckon with their place in the patriarchy and in society and how they uh, have evolved but could continue to evolve further and are not, not the be-all, end-all of things. I think that's the other thing the movie is like. Barbie is a view of a certain kind of femininity, but it does not have to be everything. Yeah. Oh, man. 
America Ferrera is so good in this movie. Um, and and she, is, she is a bit of a cipher, but she is a cipher that is like well, expounding and I think, the themes of the film. <laughs> I think something that really works about her is also the, the contrast with her daughter character as well, which allows her to, uh, if she's a cipher, it at least allows her somebody to uh, push back her thoughts on, right? Like to, yeah. to actually have somebody to, so it's not, if it was just her and Barbie, it'd be something different. Also great in this movie. And I, 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 I uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention her is Rhea Perlman, who of course, uh, you know, being the massive cheers fan that I am seeing Carla yeah. in this movie as the creator of Barbie boy, she gets two just great scenes and she crushes it, man. Love and Rhea Perlman. You talk about like things, this, that movies don't necessarily aren't the place to address them. And it's like, okay, yeah, the, the cynical creation of Barbie and uh, let us say the creator's uh, creative uh, engagement with the American tax code. Um. <laughs> that is true. All of that is true. And you can watch that toys that made us. And the yeah. woman who created Barbie is a very interesting figure. <laughs> Uh, but um, is this the place for that like discussion about her engagement with a uh, creative fraud? Probably not. <laughs> no, but it, it's a very, what I like is the movie just does a very funny sort of acknowledgement and then move on from it. Like mm -hmm. it's very, it's very funny. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's just, the movie's just, it's, it's such a pleasant film. It's such a funny film. It does say things in a way that doesn't feel preachy or is going to make you feel bad about it, but it gives you some things to think about. And yeah. I think that's good, man. And I, that's if there's one lesson that I hope Hollywood learns, it's that just an embracement of that in a broad strokes. Don't be afraid to have a movie be fun. It does feel like so often movies come down to is like this movie is either fun or it's important. Yeah. And, you you know, you can't have fun and talk about serious things or you can't talk about serious things and also have fun. And I hope that more people embrace that from Barbie as opposed to literally making serious movies about toys. Yeah. No, and I, I completely agree. I think of the two films, Barbie is the one that I appreciate the most because it is trying to, and succeeding at being the full package. Like, it feels like a fun movie experience. Oppenheimer is a technical masterpiece. It is yeah. something that I appreciate from a craft level and a filmmaking level and that did shake me emotionally, but that was maybe because I'd been in a theater for eight hours and I felt drained and <laughs> even, even There's a cat I... who's lost his patience now. Um, oh, that's fair. Uh, no, yeah. no. Well, I do think Barbie is the, the, the more difficult feat to pull off, right? Like, yeah. Nolan making an Oppenheimer biopic, the, the 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 restraints are pretty much off. Like we're saying, he can command any budget, he can get any actor he wants, and he's such a a, a, a clear auteur that Nolan making an Oppenheimer movie is, and this is in no way to take away from because I do think it is one of his finest works as a filmmaker, but it is a, a Nolan Oppenheimer movie. It kind of is like if you told me Nolan's making an Oppenheimer movie, I knew it would resemble something like this. I think he took it even further than what I would have thought of in terms of the quality of it. But Barbie is the greater like, wow, that is, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm amazed this exists. Um, it's, it would have been so easy to make a Barbie movie that was disposable, to make yeah. one that has something to say and is, I think, a culturally important film and a film that is striking at a moment in which the culture can embrace it is yeah. the more impressive feat. Being able being able to be culturally important but also appeal to people is yeah. also like I said that that's 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 a rare feat. And also though I do applaud the American public for going to Oppenheimer which is a more challenging film and is a longer film and is a very serious movie. Um, you know, and and the fact that it's still making as much money as it is, and literally, I saw it in a packed theater, and there was a line down the street around the block to go into the next showing when yeah. I left. So that's amazing. I mean, that like I said, the 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 idea that you would think on in a lot of ways, people go like, well, Oppenheimer will win all the Oscars, but nobody saw it because it's it's very difficult, and it's I mean, it's just also just long. I mean, forget the subject matter. Just that's a commitment to go into a three hour movie, especially yeah. a three hour character drama essentially there's definitely spectacle to it but not as you're saying not in the traditional blockbuster sense more in the more in the classic epic fashion that i'm talking about guys like david lean and stuff like that when they're making lawrence mm -hmm. arabia or bridge on the river Kwai, where it's all about the massive scope of the movie as opposed to visceral action which if you want that 
Mission Impossible you can't go wrong with because that movie is sure action at that level. So or that's in a the week thing. we're gonna get Ninja Turtles, which is probably yeah. Look, I, I haven't seen that movie, so I can't speak mm-hmm. to the the resonant themes of uh, mutant mayhem yet. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm uh, saying like it, it, it. Yeah, it is. You know the. But the, I, I, I'm I'm glad people are going to it because I do think certainly it's a movie that that I think is. Uh, I mean, I think in terms of if you get into like objective stuff, uh, you know, uh, what are awards is a political thing, but to what I feel deserves recognition, Oppenheimer is across the board on every level um just masterful in, sure. in every aspect of filmmaking um and, and and acting as well i think the acting is i think killian murphy is certainly already a front runner for any kind of acting recognition and downey in supporting categories is incredible as well so totally uh, but that is not to diminish like like you said if ryan gosling doesn't get some kind of nomination yeah. for supporting and also as we've talked about for sure the production design of it my god it's a stunning looking movie set yeah. design art direction all of that stuff i think screenplay like i said i think the screenplay is incredible what it pulls off so uh, I, am, board, I, am, I, think... I am Knuff, uh best original song <laughs> uh I, i'm just ken i think is the song I'm yeah but ken. yeah the, the and the hoodie, by the way, is apparently impossible to find. It's selling out ever. Is the I am Knuff. but I want uh, it. oh I want it yeah, so I'm bad. just Ken is is definitely the front runner for best song though. Um, <laughs> and in the world, I'd be a ten. Um, <laughs> I loved it. I loved it so much, and all that stuff is great. Yeah, I, no, I think they're they're both they're both great movies. They're both seeking different things. I'm so glad. Uh, I think you know I've seen some hardcore film nerds go like this is bad for the industry to try to lump these two things together it's like i don't know man i think it's i think it's good for the industry as a whole and i think it's good for both movies because i think they both got uh, more attention and different kinds of attention than they would have had they come out uh at different times i will say having Mm -hmm. said all of what we've had said for the last two hours yeah I do not recommend seeing these movies back to back unless you have the constitution to do so. Sure. No, I agree. I I don't remember the last time I saw two movies back to back, period. Um, I don't really do that. Uh, I, even I do. I it was uh, Alien vs. Predator, Requiem, and Sweeney Todd, but that's beside the point. Boy, Sweeney Todd looks a lot better in that comparison. I'll just say yeah, that. I'm I know. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I have my issues with Sweeney Todd, which is one of my favorite musicals. And uh, there's a lot I like about the movie, and there's a lot of problems. But holy crap, is it a better experience than <laughs> Alien vs. Predator Requiem? Um, a lot of blood, though. You saw a lot of blood that day. That's for sure. Uh, that's true. Uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, of course, uh, as we wrap things up, we want to point people towards if they want even more content from us. Uh, they can head over to our Podbean patron page, which is patron.podbean.com slash punch up. There you can get exclusive bonus content from you and I, Gurgoni, uh, mm-hmm. full archives of our old shows, uh, plus uh, exclusive content as well from the Action Shelf, uh, Campbell and Jones Meet the Monsters, Material Components, all the shows here on the Punch Up Entertainment Network. And you help support the, the shows to make these shows even better, as if that were possible. I mean, uh, I think it is probably possible, and I would like to see what we could accomplish with even more support from our lovely fans. Let's see what happens. Yeah, there's lots of fun stuff over there. Uh, and, of course, if you're uh, watching us on YouTube, make sure you uh, ring the bell for notifications. Hit the like, subscribe, down all the somewhere. good things. Yeah, it's all down there. And leave your comments below. Did you see Barbenheimer as one experience? And if so, are you okay? Yeah, uh, please let us know because <laughs> you're worthy, you're enough, and I want to make sure you're doing all right after experiencing both of those films. You're enough and you're Kenoff as well. Um <laughs> But yeah, that's going to wrap things up for this month's uh, panel up. I don't know. We're in a weird place with stuff. I think uh, the next one of these we're doing, I think, might be about Ahsoka. Uh, that we'll might be see. right. We'll uh, see. Yeah, the, there's a lot of release dates getting pushed around because of something like we didn't really dive into at all is the ongoing efforts of the, the WGA and SAG in terms of their... We touched uh, on a little bit, but yeah, that that by doing that, uh, that's, that's forcing a lot of stuff to move around. I don't know. We haven't yet seen that with the streaming shows as much as with theatrical movie releases. Right. But we'll see. Um, so we're, we're going to play by ear on that uh, and see what we end up talking about for September. But If uh, we don't tar- start talking about a Star Wars show, I will lose my mind. Oh, Jeff. I think we will talk about Ahsoka. It's just uh, <laughs> I, I think that actually, now that I look at that, that probably might be October's episode mm, that's uh, fair. since that's coming out as a multi-part thing. We'll see, though. We'll talk about something. That's for sure. We may talk, ooh, we may get to talk about Star Trek. Maybe we should talk about Strange New Worlds. Oh, um, you know, I'd be down for that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, I uh, literally live for that. Um, so, uh, but uh, that's going to do it for uh, this month's Panel Up episode. I've been John Campbell. And I will always be Mike Gregoni. Till next month, we're going to panel down. Oh, <laughs>